I can now declare the meeting open to the public. Uh, we'll just wait for members of the public to come in before we commence, if anybody is coming in. Okay, uh, members, um, all very welcome to today's meeting. Can I just remind those people that are sitting in the public gallery um, of the protocols around electronic equipment? Um, all telephones must be switched off. You are allowed to use tablet devices, and please use that through the Wi-Fi and keep it on silent. And also the use of recording equipment and taking photographs is not prohibited. Um, also remind members of the protocol around electronic devices as well. And uh, then we'll move on then to item uh, agenda number one, which is apologies. We have an apology from Carol. Anything, any other members want to highlight at this stage around apologies? Yeah. No? Okay. <coughs> we'll move on then to item number two, which is the draft minutes. Can I refer members to page five of their meeting pack and ask members, are they content with the minutes of the 30th of January 2020 as drafted? Agreed. That's agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Item number three then, members, is matters arising and refer you to page 25 of your meeting pack. Um, a response from the department to a committee query on polygamous marriage in the context of enhanced disability premium. Um, this query was uh, uh, rose last week from Kelly and then Mark later on in the, in the, in the, uh, the meeting. Um, so I just want to draw members to that and ask are they content or have any comments? Yes, it's good to have that clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Move on then to um, page number 26, which is a letter from the department asking the committee to consider a briefing from the minister on the drafting of an assembly bill on social sector size criteria for introduction to the assembly by accelerated passage. Can I ask our members content to receive a ministerial briefing? Um, on the 13th of February? Yes. Okay, all content? Yes. yes. Um, then can I ask members to move on then to the correspondence memo, memo on page 28 of the meeting pack? And can I draw uh, your attention to page 41? This is an invitation um, to hold our meeting on the 27th of February at Camp Hill Community, Glen Craig, which is in Hollywood. Um, members will know the minister is due to attend the committee that day. No, she's not going to attend that day. All right. Um, so we just then will, between ourselves then, um, we'll decide uh, over the next week whether or not we want to go to Camp Hill and uh, join them and have our committee meeting there. Um, that is, we've, we've done it in previous committees where we'll go out. We don't have to be in, uh, in here to hold a meeting, so it's always good to get out and see what's going on. Um, so other than that, are members content then with all other actions, or as well as that rather? Uh, in the correspondence memo? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, content? Okay, thank you. Okay, item number five then is a briefing by the Permanent Secretary and Deputy Secretary. Uh, members, the Permanent Secretary's briefing notice at page 47 of the meeting pack, and then there will be a, a presentation at page 60 of the meeting pack. Um, can I invite Tracy Mahard, Permanent Secretary, along with Colin Boyle, Deputy Secretary for Work and Health, and Jackie Carr, Deputy Secretary for Supporting People. You're very welcome. Thank you. And just before we start, it's just I want to bring a matter um, up in the committee. And it's while you're here, Tracy, as the most senior member, I suppose, um, an advisor to the minister. And that's the issue on Monday when a, a statement was made by the minister um, without this uh, going through the assembly. Um, it's, we see that it is rather disappointing. I certainly do as a committee chair um, that uh, we weren't afforded the, the knowledge of that prior to that happening. Um, and also that it did break with protocol. We want to have a, a good relationship uh, with yourselves and with the minister, I and mean, we will have a good relationship, but it's just to put down a marker that uh, we're di I'm disappointed in that, and it really shouldn't have happened. 
I, I know Kelly wanted to yeah. comment as well. Um, on the day, I raised a, a, a point of order to the Speaker um, just on that because it breached standing orders 18. Um, if a minister has the time to go to press, then it would be appreciated if, if you know, even if there was a mention to um, the committee about that um, and it presented to the floor of the House. Um, we want to work with the minister. We know that um, there's a big brief there um, and welfare mitigations is not something that we disagree with, but it's just the protocol. There are questions about that mitigations, where's the money coming from, um, that this committee needs to be able to scrutinise. And that, that's really, we don't want to elongate this in any way. It's just to set the marker down. We, we don't disagree with, with, the, with, the, with the statement that was made. You know, absolutely, those mitigations need to be put in place. It's just how it was done. So that was all. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I note the comments, and certainly we'll, we'll have that conversation. <coughs> Um, it's a pleasure to, to come here today and to uh, meet you all for the first time in your committee capacity. Um, I think I've met most of you previously. Um, so I've been in the Trump Secretary in the Department since um, December 2018. Um, I think you've agreed that what we're going to do is, is actually break the Department to four parts because it's such a big department. So as you know, I've got Jackie and Carmen along with me today. So all I intended to do was give a very high level um, overview of the department. Most of you will probably know it, but it will sort of give us a context for the other conversations. We are um, the largest um, department, um, created in 2016 as an amalgamation of a number of other functions and departments. We have around about 8,800 staff uh, based at 74 locations. A very large number of those staff are frontline staff um, and, um, and back office staff delivering services um, at junior to middle, middle grades. Um, that's about approximately 7,000 of those, of those, those staff. Um, 2,000 of them actually deliver services for DWP. So whilst they're based in Northern Ireland, they're actually delivering services on behalf of um, DWP to, to people in, in other parts of, of England. Um, it's a very broad and diverse department, um, and you know we do impact on the lives of nearly everybody in Northern Ireland in one way or another. Um, at a very high level, our responsibilities are welfare, benefits and pensions, helping people find employment, child maintenance, housing, urban regeneration, local government, sports, arts, culture, leisure, including museums and libraries. The relationship with the community and voluntary sector, the regulation of charities, Ulster Scots and Irish language, the protection of the historic environment, public rec records office. We also have a range of social policies, liquor licensing, gambling, to name two, which will be quite topical. Um, also, the development of, of the, we are the department who will be taking forward the development of the executive's anti poverty strategy, um, as well as the other social strategies, active aging, disability gender equality and sexual orientation. Some of those are extant and some are not. So to deliver this portfolio effectively, um, we are structured into five groups. As I said, two today and three, I think, coming to see you next week. Um, and we also have 21 arm's length bodies um, who we work in partnership to ensure the delivery is efficient. Um, so <laughs> in terms of the budget, um, I would think it would make sense for us to have a, a, you know, a more detailed conversation on the budget, because it's obviously quite complex and it's a very large budget. But at a very high level, um, this, we have a Dell resource budget of just under 800 million. Um, that budget is, uh, is also split between ring-fenced and non-ring-fenced. Like, again, we'll get into more detail on that when, when we have a conversation. Our capital budget is 196 million. 145 million of that actually goes into housing. So, there's a big demand on capital and a lot of things we could spend money on. Um, and we really need to be constantly thinking about prioritization and how we use that money most effectively. And of course, on top of this, we also have approximately 6.7 billion, which is uh, Amy annually managed expenditure, which is outside the block. So the first lot all is allocated to us through Barnet. Obviously, Amy is not. It comes uh, directly uh, into Northern Ireland on a demand-led basis. The budget has reduced in the last number of years as is similar to other departments. Um, given the nature of our budget, it has fallen more heavily in some parts of the department than others, um, because some of our budgets are ring-fenced and some are not. Um, it has been our intention through all this to make sure that we continue to deliver the best services we can and to minimize the impact on our citizens. 
um, you know, but, but at times we have had to make choices. Um, um, we are presently working with DOF, engaging with them on uh, our budget for the next number of years, and also giving some initial estimates around some of the new, new decade, new approach uh, commitments. Um, this engagement will inform the executive consideration of the wider public expenditure and budgetary challenges. So, in terms of our minister's priorities, and I know you've already had a chance to speak, some of you have a chance to speak to her. I mean, in a department of this size, there are many urgent priorities and issues for the minister to consider. And to be frank with you, we haven't gotten through all of those things yet, and you'd appreciate that, uh, you know, we're trying to take the urgent and uh, important, first of all. Um, but um, the minister has been really clear about what her priorities are in terms of a right-based approach, um, a focus on vulnerable people, and a focus on objective needs. And as you'll have mentioned at the start, um, one of the very first priorities for us was around mitigations. And I suppose that we, we, are, we are really glad that it's passed the first stage insofar as um, the executives have agreed to that, although it still has the primary and secondary leg legislation still has to be approved uh, no later than the 31st of March uh, 2020. Um, another ministerial priority will be uh, to bring forward legislation to reverse the ONS classification for housing associations. Um, the big issue there is that uh, if, whilst we've had a derogation around this for the last number of years, <coughs> if housing associations are classified as public sector entities, they can't borrow. So at the moment, for every pound from the public sector that goes in, they lever a pound from the private sector, or in other words, we can build twice as many houses. Um, and the, the derogation has been granted on the basis that we're doing our best to reverse the classification. Uh, but the area that we haven't been able to mitigate at all has been around uh, the use of FTC, and that's our affordable housing products. So every year at the moment, so our targets are just under 2,000 social and about 1,000 affordable. Um, and what we've had to do is take normal capital to continue to deliver affordable homes, and that money could have been used for other things, yeah. and particularly given the fact that FTC has been underutilised in the block, we are really, really keen to see how we can maximise the use of FTC in this department <coughs> around housing and, and, other, and other parts of it. Um, the Minister's also uh, indicated to the, uh, that the completion of both the, um, the regional and sub-regional um, stadia programme are going to be a key priority. Um, and also um, early days looking at the reform of liquor licences. Um, um, obviously the anti-poverty strategy also will be um, a, a key priority. Um, I have responsibility for the PFG Outcome 8, uh, we care for others and we help those in need. And PFG Outcomes 9, we are a shared society that respects diversity. And as a department, we are fully committed to work both with other parts of central government, with local government, with the third sector, with the private sector, to make sure that we deliver against these and really make a difference in people's lives. So what, what our focus has been um, in the last while is, in the absence of having the assembly in place, has been really to make sure that we can continue to deliver services and to do that so that there's the, minimise the impact on citizens. Um, where we, can, we could have, we have made decisions and we're very grateful to you for what you've been taking forward in terms of going through the DSRs uh, over the last while. Um, but where we couldn't, what we've been trying to do is make sure that we have been ready to give advice to ministers when they come back. So, for example, we went ahead with a consultation on liquor licensing because the other consultation was well out of date. And we wanted to make sure when the minister walked in the door that we weren't going, well, you know, we did something back there in 2016, which is pretty out of date now, and we'll start right from scratch. That means that in these areas, we want to be able to hit the round running and allow the minister to have the information in front of her to make the decisions she needs. Um, I think it would be wrong for me to sit in front of you and not to pay tribute to the work of the staff in the department, I think, over the last three years. Um, I have been out and visited many of our parts of the department, and I can say to you that the staff that I engage in care really deeply about what they do. They really want to make a difference to people's lives, and I am very grateful to them for what they have done um, in the last number of years. Um, we're really looking forward to working with you in a, in a proactive and way. Um, no doubt there will be challenges you'll put to us, and we'll take those. Um, but um, I think that's probably enough for me in terms of just a very brief over introduction. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to pass over now to my, my colleagues. Are you happy with that? Okay. Would do members prefer if we stop there and ask Tracy some questions? I think maybe and any that are going to fall into 
both of your colleagues, feel free to say we're going to discuss that later and we'll come back to it. Um, that's fair enough. So I suppose just um, thank you um, for the, the brief as well. Um, I know that we have a list of urgent priorities and we know that because uh, you know some of us have been around a while and others more recently, but we're fully aware of the priorities. We know that there's a, sort, a short window left as well um, uh, of, of, this, of this mandate. How realistic do you think or do you believe that meeting those priorities will be in that short window? So, the obviously mitigations, hopefully, yes. we're well in place with that. ONS, you're getting a briefing on that. and I mean, it will be really disappointing if we can't get that through because there is a cost to that, a real big cost. So, we should be able to achieve that. It depends what we say is an achievement. We will we will get a draft anti-poverty strategy that will have to have uh, agreement. Um, we will look at new methods for housing building and using FTC. Housing, housing doesn't get built quickly. You know, anything new we do will take two to three years to get on the ground. Similarly with the regional and sub-regional, um, to, to think that we would actually have things built in two years, but we, what we'd like to have is everything ready, you know, on track and really clear where we are. So I, I couldn't tell you at this stage we're not going to have you know diggers on the ground, but certainly we'll be doing everything in our power to move things forward. Some of some of these things are out of our control, as you'd be aware. So there are you know sometimes there are planning issues, and also part of that will be um, how much time the minister wants to take to actually consult. Um, and she's been very clear in her view that we actually need to take time to talk to uh, people at grassroots levels about these things and not just just move forward. So um, I think there's. There's things we can achieve, liquor licensing. Um, I believe we can achieve that. Um, we've already consulted on gambling. So it really depends how much consensus that we get around these issues. Um, and obviously working with you to actually make sure that, you know, when these things land, that, that we can address the things where, where we're struggling to get more consensus around. But actually there's, I think, there's a big agenda in the department and lots of things that we can actually achieve but being realistic about actually what success looks like over a two-year period. I know coming into the role as chair is very different to whenever I uh, go back to whenever I went into chair of, of the health committee, where I knew it, there was a five-year term ahead and could think of some wonderful imaginative things that I wanted to bring along also. And I'm very, um, very aware that this is a short window and you know we really do need to stick um, to the time scale and, and really do need to push things forward. So I know certainly as chair of the committee, I want to see all of those things that you talked about progress and progress in a timely manner. Um, one other issue I wanted to bring up was the, the, the reclassification of housing associations. Um, it is something that, I, I, yeah, I absolutely get where, you, where the department are coming from. I agree with it wholeheartedly um, that we do need to, to bring about that change. Um, I just want to ask, I mean, I, I do realise that that will require some sort of accelerated passage as well. I do, I do know that. Albeit, I do think it does need a little bit of scrutiny um, also by this committee. And it was just to ask, really, I know that the derogations are in place until March. Um, was there ever a conversation that you know of um, with uh, Her Majesty's Treasury to ask for those derogations even to be extended for a further three months to allow? Um, uh, to allow uh, a, a little bit more scrutiny on the matter from this committee and from the Assembly? Certainly, I know that's something that we're looking at as a contingency. The issue is that um, if we want to continue with affordable build, it's up to £3 million a month that could be costing us. So yeah, the balance between those things is something we all have to, you know, to consider. So we will continue to seek the derogation. Um, but obviously there, is, there will be an impact on our ability to use um, financial transactions capital. Okay, thank you. I have a few people. I have Kelly, Andy, Emma and Sinead. So, Kelly. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you and your staff for filling in the void very well while we were not in this place. Um, but I just want to check with you one thing. You'd mentioned about your talking already to finance about the budget. Um, have you any idea at this stage when the committee will get access to that budget um, so that we can scrutinise it for 2021? So we don't know what our budget is yet. Okay. All at this stage, what we've done is we've set out um, really what we, we think we need. 
um, and what we can manage and what we can't manage. But as I said, I think the best way to have that conversation would be to get a, you know, a dedicated uh, briefing on the budget, um, where you know how much, you know, where it goes, you know, where the pressures are, um, as, and then you can sort of that that will make more sense then when we start looking at the, what we've been. Obviously, we're talking about this stage just a single year uh, budget. Uh, what we would obviously for all of us, it's it's very very difficult, particularly with uh, large capital projects to manage. Um, on an annual basis on capital projects, and it does sometimes lead to, I think, suboptimal decisions potentially because you don't want to create a very large overhang um, liability in the absence of, th of three-year budgets. But we are very happy to, to, to um, have a conversation and explain to you about all about the budget. Just, a couple, kind of thing, just a couple more questions, Chair. Um, one of the things you mentioned is objective need, and during the negotiations on the new decade, um, objective need came up quite a lot on the programme for government discussions, was never defined. Um, my concern on that would be is how the department's going to treat objective need and how do you ensure then that somebody's objective need, like mine, um, doesn't override another person's need and, and how that's going to be met and, and how is the officials going to plan to deal with that? Um, that's obviously clearly a challenge for us, um, and I think it's something that will be um, will we'll come through the uh, anti-poverty strategy as we start to, to look at that. Um, it would be fair to say there, there are various mechanisms already that, that we use, um, whether it's the allocation of housing. You know, there's various things that, that we need to look at right across the, the piece about how actually need is defined and need is met. So I don't have an answer for you on that, other than to say that um, certainly I do recognise the challenge. Yeah. I welcome um, your discussion about the, the strategies. I'm very keen that co-production and co-design, that's one of the things that the Minister thankfully has said. But just thinking about that, um, part of the discussions as well was on a new outcome, which was supposed to be on housing. Yes. That outcome hasn't been fully explored and examined. I was just wondering, given the fact that the quantity of areas within the housing executive have recently uplifted um, material cost by 9%, we know that the cost of housing is going to get very expensive. Um, well, not very expensive, but it's, it's in line with market costs. Um, is there work being done in the background then at this stage with the Minister and, and yourselves on that new outcome in housing and how it, because it will directly impact communities? Yeah, so... Thank you. Um, We've, we've given a full brief on, I suppose, the, the strategic challenges in housing for the Minister, which is um, ONS reclassification, how we deal with the existing stock that we have in the housing executive, which is every day getting older, and uh, how we can uh, build you know, new houses, how we can actually use different mechanisms. There are big, big issues in here, land availability, sewage availability, capital availability. Um, but we've given the minister that you know, the original, the initial. I suppose the thing is the ONS is the, the thing that starts to unlock. But we, you know, if we solve that, that won't solve the problem. That's only one part of an, a range of issues which we need to look at, and all these things will have to be taken account of in the um, in the outcome. This is a really true cross-cutting area. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Um, and at the start, can I echo Kelly's comments and yours, Tracy, in paying tribute to the staff at the department for holding the fort whilst we weren't in this place. Um, you've done a tremendous job, um, and I know it's under extreme pressures. Just to elaborate further on Kelly's point in relation to, to the budget, and indeed we look forward as committee to getting the budget, you mentioned engagement with Treasury or with the Finance Department in relation to budgetary pressures or challenges. Can you maybe elaborate more on that, what, what discussions and what challenges they are? Well, um, so we've been operating on flat budgets and, and also we've had to take some reductions. So obviously every year our staff, when you've got 8,800 staff, you know, a 1% increase in budget, hmm. uh, you know, obviously has an impact on that. So even managing to absorb our own costs um, are going to be a key, you know, key, key challenges in there. Um, <coughs> a large parts of the sector, like, let's take, you know, we haven't given up lifts on things for a number of years. So let's take one example, which is very topical, supporting people. We've protected that budget at 73 million, a very, very large sum of money, since I think since 2013. Um, but, you know, and, and actually protected that budget when other budgets have actually taken a reduction. And yet that still is for them a real time issue because they have increases in costs as well. <coughs> um, 
the um, you know things like our neighbourhood and rural budgets under pressure. I mean, if you spoke to any of our, I suppose our stakeholders where budgets haven't been protected, it, it has been tight for everybody. Um, I suppose you know in a, in a way the pain has been you know shared uh, across. So the arts sector would say that things that I mean we we have core assets in our arts portfolio, which we are, str are struggling to be available. Um, you know we haven't been able to uplift in areas where we'd maybe want want to. The big issue is without ministers over the last number of years, we couldn't make the decisions that needed to be taken to reprioritise our funding. Um, the fact is, if we're, if we're going to operate on flat budgets, if we're going to do new things or better things, we have to stop old things which are not delivering. And that's always very, very difficult. And that was one thing we couldn't do as, as, as officials. So we were kind of like taking a cut off here, taking a cut off there. Um, I suppose if you spoke to any of our stakeholders, they would say that it's been challenging over the last number of years. I don't think any of my colleagues have anything else to add on that. Just, just a couple of further questions, Chair. Um, and indeed, I make note around the welfare mitigation. Indeed, I, I believe we're the Assembly and many of my colleagues are in broad agreement at the need and necessity to bring forward the mitigations in relation to SSC, um, the benefit cap, uh, and looking at other areas of mitigation. Um, are you able to indicate at this point, you know, what, what new mitigations potentially are going to come forward uh, and any costs associated to that? It's very early days. And listen, I know Colm may pick this up in, in his. It's a very early days. Um, what, we, what we do know is that some, you know, we, we have the report from the um, Human Rights, um, Les Ambley's report, yes, Commission, um, which has costed out a number of, a number of um, potential mitigations in there. I suppose from our perspective, uh, you know, from, for all of us, what we have to ask ourselves the question is, where do we get the most bang for our buck? You know, we're not going to have enough money to do everything. What is it that we do is going to have the biggest impact, um, and it, it, it have the biggest impact on poverty? And um, is it putting more money into some of the mitigations? Is it is it new things that we need to do? Those are the things that the minister is going to have to consider. Um, we we have costed out some of them, and you know, there's some pretty scary stuff in there. I mean. As you, you've seen, the um, how much is the annual 160 for the the two the, the uh, it's 100. It was 160. Yeah. So if you if we did everything in the in that report, it'd be 160 million pounds a year, and the reality is, well, unless something changes, we're not going to have 160 million a year. So we are going to have to focus on uh, those things which um, <clears throat> we can do. But of course, if we get the extra money, that's a whole different conversation. If you're doing everything that's been coming forward from all of the organisations, advisory organisations and other lobby groups to deal with the big issues that, that people are picking up and, and ones I know the Minister's very focused on as well, you'd be talking, you, some, you're pretty well going towards half a billion, so you're talking about probably about £350 million pounds to do all of that stuff. So some of that's eye-watering in terms of its quantum. Um, and one of the reasons we gave you the slide deck, the slide deck I have, is to let you see where parity actually sits and what parity actually means. And any time we step away from parity, the metre runs. Uh, and when the metre runs for that scale of people that we have in Northern Ireland, I mean, the cost of the bedroom tax alone, 34 million, yeah. it's a lot of money. Yeah. Just, just, just on that point, but I'm sure we'll all agree the bedroom tax, we have unique circumstances here Absolutely. in Northern Ireland. And back to that. Yeah. And it's imperative that we do mitigate for the bedroom tax, and, and I welcome the Minister the, bringing legislation yeah, forward. The Department brought in this report last year. Yes. And we set out, and well in advance of any of this, when we were when we were looking after things, the bedroom tax needed to be extended. There was yes. no question yeah. of that. And I know certainly, um, it's, I, I, I plan on discussing it actually just after you finish, is that we we will be asking for a, a full brief yeah. um, to the committee on the review of the welfare reform mitigations because it's exactly for those reasons. Are we doing the right thing? I mean, the, there's. Not too many of us believe that it, was good, it is good legislation that is in place. It certainly isn't, and it affects um, so many people here in Northern Ireland. So, but we want to make sure that we're putting the money in the right place, and, um, and is it having the right effect? More so, if it's been in for several years, and it would be good to know um, how it is actually affecting people. So I think that's, that is something we as a committee um, most definitely want a briefing on, um, sort of next week or the week after. No Sorry, Andy, do you No, you're okay, Chair. Sure. Um, is there any further points you want to make before I ask? Oh, no, just to say, I mean, look, the minister's made a really clear her view on this. Uh, she's she's anti austerity and anti welfare cuts, yeah. and she wants to do everything that she can to actually address these issues. But so that but this is a matter of step, stepping through these. 
Yep. And, and as part of welfare reform, just to, to finish up on that, that point, because you know, could labour it all day, um, and I'm sure we'll be getting uh, detailed briefings in the future. Um, the advice sector is imperative into ensuring individuals are shielded from some of the worst effects of welfare reform. Uh, and, and indeed, the, the advice and guidance that individuals are given is, is crucial. One aspect of that is when an individual obviously does apply for a specific benefit uh, and they're perhaps turned down. A crucial factor of that is the, uh, the tribunal representation. So uh, is there work ongoing in relation to that? Because I know that sector felt that it was underfunded in the past. Yes, so um, we have, um, I think our bid includes, is it £2 million for advisory advice? So we have, we have been bidding oh for, uh, for, you know, and obviously this is on top of the money that the department, the department already funds advice sectors, but uh, we had, we had in, you know, we reckon we did an independent review actually. SIB did a review for us on the advice sector to give us some advice on whether indeed the amount of money we were putting in there was, was the appropriate amount. So that helped us um, actually. Um, make the assessment that, that that required to be continued. Yeah, just, just to make a point, I know, I know citywide tribunal service, and I know there's other tribunal services, but they've, uh, from experience in my own constituency, they've been absolutely crucial in helping individuals to fight um, wrong decisions in the tribunals. So, um, on that point, just just moving now to the regional and sub-regional stadia programmes, and, and it's an area I've asked a number of questions on, and I'm sure there's deep frustration right right across the the fraternity in respect to that. You know, this was a commitment back in 2011, uh, and, and we haven't seen it fully delivered as yet. Um, there, there's some um, angst out there amongst the football fraternity, and I raised this last week, um, about a new consultation pro process in relation to sub-regional. Can you confirm that that is going to be required? No, because I haven't um, had the, this conversation with the Minister yet. So we have briefed Minister um, at a high level um, okay. on this. Um, what, what is for certain is that a lot of things have changed in the, in the sector between the last consultation and now. And we've started, we have been having informal conversations with the sector, which will inform our advice to the minister. Okay. Uh, but, you know, that, that is something that she has not made a call on yet. And uh, we like to see that any time soon. Sorry to... Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it, it really is, it's like, um, it's, it's not that any of these things aren't important. It's just no. that getting, getting to them um, is, is and, and as soon as uh, she has a chance to, you know, yeah. make it to us, say to her that the committee are very keen to know what her... What, what decision is on this? Yep. Indeed, and, and I'm sure you'll heard from the engagement you've had with many of the stakeholders. A lot of the grounds, and um, there's serious safety concerns in respect to that. You know, going back to 2011, and that's not a criticism of yourselves. It's in part a criticism of, of ourselves that we haven't managed to deliver this since 2011. Um, the the sub-regional stadia program um, was allocated, I believe, 36 million. Is that going to be the case again, or is that forming part of the conversation? And also, as an addition to that. Um, the 36 million obviously has to be refined within the department. Um, are you confident that that can be found in line with the priority in New Decade New Approach? So there is a number of things in the New Decade New Approach which are not funded, which we need to look at. So I'll answer your question in two parts. First of all, I took the opportunity to actually go around and look at some football grounds to mm. see what was going on. Not um, don't, don't do football, but it <laughs> really did strike me when I went round the important role they play in society. Not, not as sporting facilities does, but the outreach they do to youth. Uh, and you know the, what the, the 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 role in they can have. So I'm really persuaded of of the value of that. The the amount um, was there was a total amount set for the whole um, program. Um, and I suppose the question is, if one part goes out of sync, what happens to the other parts of it? So that was one of the, my issues in terms of making any decisions without a minister. Um, the, the you know the the executive will have to look at this across the piece in terms of financing and what new decade new approach is going to cost and determine what the priorities are and that's that's you know the the, the funding for the capital will have to be found out of the block um because I, I don't have it you know at the moment so that those are things that will have to be considered and also the timing of that we need to look at and say real, realistically when will that actually start to be spent out because yep. uh, it won't all be 36 million, you know, at one one go. No. So still working our way through all of those things. And has there been conversations with the finance minister in respect to that to indicate that obviously the yes. 36 million is not within the capital yes. gift of your department? So we have um, done a very detailed, uh, high level, I should say, because it's very speculative okay. uh, piece of work around some of the costs of new decade, new approach, um, so that they actually finance and um, actually. Um, so you know, I will continue to meet with the Department of Finance on that. Just one final question, Chair, if you'll indulge me. Um, 
the obviously the one is a central point that and you mentioned the FTC in relation to um, inhibiting us to be able to deliver on affordable and you're having to take that into your capital grant. Um, is there any work ongoing within the department to increase our capacity to build uh, more social and affordable housing? And I take into consideration, obviously, ONS is a factor of that, but is there any work ongoing in that area? Yes, I mean, we, the, at the moment, the biggest constraints are, as I said, are, is land availability um, and um, obviously the sewage infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. so I have had this conversation with my colleagues in, in DFI and they are very much aware of that. Um, and, but, you know, of, we are looking at other options um, as well. Um, um, for example, you know, we know other regions are, are doing, using some other products, things like, you know, other ones to support people to buy their own homes and a range of other things as well as social, social housing. But ultimately, it, it all comes back to, that, I mean, that water is going to be a big issue. Sewage yeah. and water is going to be a big issue for, the, up for us. Yeah, and we, we just need to recognise that. That there's loads of things we're doing in housing. We're looking at city centre living. We're working with councils around, you know, working, identifying, you know, plots of land that we can actually maybe work on together. So there are there's lots of <laughs> lots of work ongoing okay. in there. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Emma. Thank you um, for your your presentation. Um, I just have a wee question. It's um, sort of broader around some of the strategies. I know you've outlined um, the strategies that are going to be the remit of, of this um, department, but obviously there were a, a range of strategies outlined in NDNA, and we had heard from the um, Home Secretary, the David Sterling, last week that who was taking what had yet to be decided. So I'm just wondering, is this is this the final list for communities? Can can we work on the assumption that everything else is going to fall to somewhere else? Yeah, the the, the question there was around language. Uh, uh, that's one of uh, yeah, one of them. But yeah, there's there's broader like child care strategy. So you've said that the the child poverty strategy yes. falls within communities, but then child care obviously. Yeah. So I think we're we're pretty clear on the the the, the actual those those policies that we'll retain responsibility on this as decision made because that would be set out in when the, when they transferred the the various parts to the department. I suppose one of the questions for the minister will have to be whether she, you know what, whether she pro proposes to roll the the child poverty strategy into the anti poverty strategy or do it separate, um, and and how all these things are going to link together. So they all they all need to be done. Some of them, as I say, are. Um, out of, uh, you know, out of date now, um, and we've just been rolling them forward. But the actual, um, it's a DE Department of Education obviously has the responsibility for the the outcome on on children. We could, you know, so we'll we'll work with DE and other departments around those things. So it's not really decided. What David Sterling was saying is so. But I, I, I'm, I, I. I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to, other than the, the no. commissioners and the languages, other things which are not all the strategies that were outlined. So we, had, All right. so we were sort of working on the basis that the languages commissioners were going to be the remit of executive office. Um, but just in terms of the other strategies, he was saying that they were yet to be sort of divvied out. So that's still well, the case. No, no. He hasn't told me that yet. <laughs> so uh, my understanding is that we're, we'll continue to be responsible for those for those ones. And okay, certainly the big, the big one there, for, I think, for everybody is the anti-poverty strategy, which is... Um, but I'll, I'll have a chat to him and see what he was saying there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. Uh, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I think it's. Uh, I'm glad to hear the consensus around the table um, in terms of parity and an objective need. Um, because one thing, one group who haven't felt the benefits of parity or objective need throughout the last 10 years is the GA community um, in Ulster because. Um, we're waiting 10 years for casement to be built, and I know that the minister has outlined her priority um, in terms of that, and that's that's very much welcome because we're really not prepared to wait any longer for that. Um, I think as well we need to stop confusing subjective need and objective need, um, and I've heard that a, a few times now. And and you know, subjective need is, is we all have a subjective need. What we're talking about here is where, um, where, where money and where funds need to be um, targeted um, to meet that objective need. Um, just on, on that as well, and Andy, you've covered a lot of, of, of what I was going to bring up in terms of, right. of regional um, stuff. Um, but I'm just thinking, um, uh, when there is a consultation on the sub-regional um, uh, stadium uh, project, I think it's very important that we look at, at it in terms of objective need. 
um, because a lot of grounds who, who, who desperately need the money um, to, for, for infrastructure and to update um, uh, to improve their health and safety standards and, and things like that, um, maybe won't, won't make it on the list because of the designated grounds legislation. And I'm just wondering how, I know you won't have the answers to that yet, but I, I just want to put it out there and, and make people aware that that could have an a adverse effect, that legislation, on ensuring that the money goes where it should in terms of objective need. Um, and also, I think it's important to state that it's, it's, it's my belief that the department should be the, 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 the um, organisation responsible for actually um, you know, overseeing the money being spent in, uh, as opposed to any other sort of arm's length body um, because I believe they're in the best position to do that and to ensure that objective need is at the core of, of where that funding is going. And I mean, as officials, um, clearly objectivity is one of our core values and something that we like to bring to everything. Um, so where does the evidence lead us in these things? What is our objective and where does the evidence bring us? So we're very comfortable with that as, a, as, as, as a, an approach. And I think going forward as well, this is again is another subject that will be uh, part of our committee business and our forward work plan um, is to delve more deeply into this and have not only the department but all of those other interested parties as well come and brief us, which we need to hear. Um, their point of view as well. So um, certainly will be on our forward work programme this one also. Um, thank you, Sinead, are you okay then? Yeah, finished? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Robin? Uh, thank you, Chair, and welcome, uh, Tracy and her teams uh, to, to, the, to the meeting. Uh, can I uh, reiterate what has just been said uh, about the uh, stadium? Uh, I mean, this has been around for such a long time, as Andy uh, initially said. And I do think, Chair, that if this is not, and you've described it as a priority in your briefing notes, and can I thank you for your briefing notes? I've never been at a committee meeting before where briefing notes have been provided, so that's very refreshing and extremely helpful, so thank you for that. Um, there are issues around health and safety uh, in football grounds, and you recognise yourself having visited some of the uh, stadium. The, the good work that is being done, not just sport for sport, but sport in a wider context and, and what it delivers to society as a whole. I would just make the point, uh, you've covered it I think fairly well, that if this is not, if it is kept on the long finger, if there are not decisions made, then the frustration that was felt during the period of time when we were inactive will lead to even greater frustration and perhaps tumble over into being angry uh, uh, at the situation. So I think it is the, 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 the sub-regional uh, stadium has to be, I think, a priority for the wider uh, community and the benefits of the wider community. Can I just ask about the housing executive and the role of the housing executive? Uh, I note the, the, the work that's being done for the housing associations. Um, can I, we have a, uh, you'd sort of referred to it yourself, you'd said about, you know, the current housing stock, and we have, if my memory is right, 33 high-rise blocks of housing that are being looked at with a strategy <coughs> being developed around them. I'll, I'll only speak, and I know this tumbles over into other constituencies as well, but East Belfast has a fair number of them. The 33 in total, and I don't know what the total number of people are, and I can do a guess at it, but where do we find the money? Where do we find the new build? Uh, bearing in mind, and you referred to yourself, Tracy, that um, land is a problem. Reducing, if it did get to the stage of reducing all the tar blocks, and I don't think it probably will, but if it did uh, get to that, the, the amount of land required to rehouse those people uh, would, 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 be, would be significant. Um, and is there, a, is there any thought on allowing the housing executive to build houses once again? Is there any thinking around that? So, um the key challenge for the housing executive is that its, <coughs> its present structure means that it can't borrow. Yeah. So um, either we have to find very many millions within the block, 
or we need to find a way to actually um, look at whether we can divide the housing executive into a regional body, one which is a strategic advisory one, and into one which is a delivery uh, body, or it can borrow. Um, and then if it could borrow, then it could address the backlog of its stock. Um, but it also then could potentially uh, build, build again. Obviously, these are big decisions that need to be made um, moving forward. Um, tab blocks are a big, big challenge in that, in that context because um, you're right, um, they do hold a very large number of people, but they also there is a number of big issues around tab blocks in terms of the costs, in terms of the concierge services and other things to make them work effectively. So you will be getting a full briefing on housing, and I suggest probably the, some of that detail might be better coming, coming across there. But um, the, the, these things will be had, the conversation will be had with ministers. <coughs> The, the housing executive issue is becoming more and more urgent because actually they may have to decommission um, housing. So this is like a bath where we're building new houses at the top and they're going to be falling out the bottom. bottom. Um, and so you know, there's no point in us sort of focusing all our energies on building new houses if we're actually losing houses at the other end. So these things all have to be addressed. Can I, Chair, just as a, is there a, is there any assessment on the uh, quality of housing executive stock at the moment? Yes, there is. There's a very detailed piece of work done by Savills. I can't remember, sorry, on top of my head, but a very detailed, it sets out the many uh, billions that need to be uh, invested. Uh, and in the next five years, it's, 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 a very, you know, it's a very significant sum of money. I just don't remember what it is at the moment. But yes, and it is pretty up to date too. Okay. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I think again, this is another, another uh, thing of hopefully in our forward work programme certainly is yeah. the, the whole issue around housing and um, certainly as a, a North Belfast MLA um, where we have a, a serious amount of tar blocks um, so between East Belfast and North Belfast um, there will be some uh, questions that will require answering um, but I know I know that you're not you're not directly responsible but are responsible when it comes to the housing executive um, but uh, the the whole of issues around communication and uh, especially with the residents of those tar blocks and just moving forward there's been a lot of scaremongering there's been um, a lot of misinformation as well and in, in certainly I know in my own community um, so I think there'd be many questions that need answered around any tar block strategy going ahead um, certainly with our East and North Belfast members without a doubt here. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, you know, once we have the initial briefings, it's a bit the housing executive here as well. So yes. you can have the conversation yeah. with the housing executive as well as the officials in the department. Rob, you finished on that little bit? Uh, yeah, thank you. I have two members that want to ask small supplementaries here, and I'm going to allow them in before I bring Johnny in. So, Mark, you wanted to ask supplementary on the housing, was it? No, or no, a different? Okay, Sinead. No, it's, it's a different matter, so oh. I don't mind if you want to. No, well, okay, we'll head on then. Um, sure, can you... I ask a supplementary? Yes, you certainly, Andy. Certainly, um, sorry. Just, Tracy, um, and you made a comment around uh, the availability of land. I know there was work ongoing within departments in relation to a central land registry. Yes. Can you maybe provide a quick update on that? Yeah, well, I, um, so work has been done um, and there has been some land identified and I actually got a briefing note this week that there is a um, I think land property services are, are taking this forward they've developed a, a sort of a, a software package so that we can see that and I've asked to go and see that I haven't actually been to, to be briefed on that yet so quite substantial work has been done on that I, I remember the top of my head I think was six sites were identified in, in, in the in the works but I, I, I just can't remember the top of my head thanks okay Andy thank you um, Johnny. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Tracy. I look forward to working with you and your team. Uh, I haven't met you before, so I, I, I praise the, the work of the team during the period of the, the institutions not operating. I know it must have been a very difficult time, and talking to a lot of your wider staff on the ground that we would deal with day to day, I, I know uh, the tremendous pressure that they were under, but it, it's good now that uh, through the, as the committee or the assembly we can engage directly uh, and work for the best of our constituents. I suppose probably a lot of my points are touching on previous points that have been mentioned, but and I thank the chair and the vice chair for, for raising this matter. I, th I thought it was a, a matter of discourtesy that uh, the mitigation measures that were announced in, in the Great Hall meters away from the Assembly Chamber where the, where the minister was due up, and I thought that would have been courteous for her to, to talk to the, 
uh, assembly and indeed us as committee members before doing so. But you, you mentioned specifically about <coughs> intervention by Andy and, and the funding for independent advice uh, services within that. I think you said <coughs> something in the region of two million. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a wee bit more in terms of specifically uh, where, where the department's direction of travel is in relation to how they see that be, being best spent and, and best used? Because from an advice perspective, I think every member around this committee would agree that that's, that's the priority issue. There's a lot of confusion out there among many uh, as to um, the services that they can access and when. Well, really we're rolling over the existing support mm -hmm. mechanisms. So what people have had access to before, they'll have access to again. Um, some of the money I know um, goes in through the councils as well. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any, any <coughs> changes in, in that. It, it, yeah, no, that's just yeah. clarification on that yeah, point. Okay. I suppose, uh, is it new services or? Yeah, no, this, this, and of course, I mean, also to mention that in, in within the department, we also have the Make the Call, um, which, um, like last year alone, I think the, the figures were over 40 million of um, you know, extra benefits. So there's the external ad advisory uh, and also the, the internal uh, within the department, which, which um, Jackie has responsibility for. Yeah. And Tracy and Chair, just imagine in terms of Make the Call, there's the advice in relation to benefit take-up, but there's also a lot of work as well in terms of signposting to other services and other support mechanisms across the wider public services. So it's quite a you know all-embracing <coughs> approach, wraparound approach to access to public services and support for individuals. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for that. In, in relation to it was mentioned earlier, um, the department's uh, responsibility in the elements of the new decade, new approach day. Um, <coughs> I sensed a wee bit of ambiguity as it's still in relation to what actually falls to which department. Uh, are, are you any clearer on, on when we might receive information from the department as to exactly what falls under your remit? Um, in well, comparison we, with like TEO, etc. Well, we could certainly tell you what we know falls within our remit at this stage. Yeah. Okay. That's something we can certainly do. Um, the, the, the area that we're not certain about is just around some of the, the commission, commissioners and language, which we think is, is TEO. Okay. But just but, if possible, when you have that information, to, yep, okay, I so think it would be good for we'll, the committee we'll, to... We'll do, but obviously, um, we would have responsibility, but it, it, it would need to be funded. Mm -hmm. So that's... Yeah. Uh, and lastly, Chair, for, for me, it's just to, to reiterate, I think you'll be very clear from around the table, the, the need uh, for this, the, the sub-regional stadium funding. Um, I think it's clear among all members, especially, and I, I want to put a plug as someone from an outside of Belfast constituency, some of the, the stadium that's, that's being used at the moment, it's, it's third world conditions. That no, no toilet facilities, no disabled uh, facilities. It's, it is a real shame. You did mention, and I'm glad you did, many of these clubs form uh, the community hub for, for, for rural communities and semi-rural communities outside Belfast and indeed in Belfast, but there's a real lack of funding and, and I think that that has to be expressed by all that we'd like to see the department. I know the Minister mentioned it as a priority issue, so I'd like to, uh, to see uh, you reiterate that back from the committee. <coughs> Thanks. Kelly, did you want to come in on a point that Johnny made there? Yes, if, if you don't mind. Um, I'm a bit concerned about this focusing in on what the department's responsible for because we're in programme for government territory, which is outcomes, and there will be pieces of other outcomes that communities will be responsible for. I'm just quite keen that we don't miss that, um, that it's not just departmental focus, that we actually look to see, for instance, if you don't have the money to deliver on something that's an outcome that will benefit health or education, then we're, we're not going to deliver the outcomes. Um, I think I'm just keen that um, when we see that list, it would be good to see the network almost like the framework of what all will touch on, on communities um, because I wouldn't want another department to cut something that's going to affect direct outcomes that communities is fully responsible for and vice versa. No, I accept that fully. Okay, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Tracy and, and the team from coming here. On my way here today, I was driving up and I was trying to think of what we could talk about or what we could potentially ask questions about and it just dawned on me the, the sheer enormity <laughs> of the department and, and the breadth of the issues that uh, you have to deal with as a department and now that we have to upscale ourselves on uh, as committee members. It struck me that last week I think Johnny had made a proposal or a request that we be furnished with the Minister's first day brief and, and I think that would be most uh, useful for uh, members to help us get our head around uh, things. Uh, at an early stage. Uh, 
there's an advantage always in speaking last and that you can maybe pick up points that people had missed but today it was a bit like bingo <laughs> striking off the notes that I have made as people have raised them first I'd like to be associated with remarks committing uh, yourself Leo before you and everyone uh, in the department for the, the, the tough job you've done in a very tough department uh, over, over the past few years obviously there are immediate priorities. We're approaching the, the cliff edge in terms of uh, mitigations, and uh, I, I, I welcome, I suppose, the urgency with which the department and the minister is uh, grasping that nettle. Uh, there, there are other issues, obviously, and housing is, is a major one that we all have to grapple with. While the department has a huge range of responsibility, I don't think there's a department that has as much potential they have as transformative an impact on communities and on individuals' lives. and there's, It's hard to think of any bigger transformation you can have than giving someone a roof over their head and somewhere warm and safe to live. So, in that essence, it's essential that we do build enough homes to house the people there in obvious and clear need of them. And in order to do so, we have to ensure we're getting the biggest bang uh, for our buck. So I had been going to come on, on, on the point that Robin raised there about the need, in my view, to empower the housing executive to use their, their stock as, as you know, capital to borrow against and get them building again as well, notwithstanding the challenges uh, that we face getting things built. So when, when you're saying that, we have to be realistic and we're only here for another two years of this mandate. So. We're not going to get that many houses built or, or stadia, be it regional or, or, or sub-regional. And when you see them building hospitals in China in a week, it, it's just sh sh shocking stuff at all. Uh, and, and I think that's something that the executive as a whole really needs to look at how we deliver projects you know, both of regional significance and of the significance of a, a home for an, a, a, an individual, how it can be done cheaper uh, or more efficiently, sorry, or effectively, and how it can be uh, done, done quicker because it's, it's just shocking. Uh, the fact that we haven't been here for three years, uh, we're talking there about the sub regional stadia fund of £36 pound, or million pounds that we don't even know if it is still there, but if it is still there, it's going to be buy you a lot less in the market than 36. It's about like the football, <laughs> the transfer window, I suppose. You'd have got a lot more for 36 million a few years ago uh, than, than uh, you will today. So it's, it's actually that there's a real financial cost as well as the opportunity cost to those uh, clubs and communities. Uh, in, in terms of the department's responsibility or oversight of local government. Uh, there are also huge issues there. I know, I know what was on the news today around the difficulty that one council has got themselves into, but there are also issues, I suppose, around other less well-off councils and uh, the red support grant that they have depended on to bring them up to a level. I've got an answer back from the minister this morning to a, a written question, saying they won't know what they're doing there until the budget's finalised, but that puts those councils who can least afford to be in it in a pretty invidious position too. And I'd be and will be asking the Minister to seek, I suppose, approval of with the approval of her executive colleagues to, to ring fence that rate support grant budget within the executive, uh, afford it the same protections that the de rating grant has to, to, to all councils because in effect the Department for Communities is just a post box for that money. It goes from finance in the department where it can get cut and will get cut to protect other service areas, such as important areas like supporting people in that, before being filtered down to councils. Uh, a, 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 another one, I suppose, would be in terms of getting the biggest bang for our buck and, and transforming people and, and lifting people and areas out of deprivation and poverty would be neighbourhood renewal. And, and, and mention has been made of it. I don't know, is there a review ongoing or has a review been done of neighbourhood renewal while there's great work going on in, in communities? I think at some stage we have to sit back and say, OK, how much has been spent in this particular area? What's it been spent on and what has been done to actually lift this area out of poverty? Because the way the funding works, there's no incentive. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't get money for getting 
bit better off. You get more money for getting worse off. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that there's groups out there doing that, but there is no incentive to lift yeah. us out of, of, of poverty. I think we need to look at where, how that money has been spent and how it uh, could be better spent. I know in terms of, again, local government and the work being done in community planning, I think there's probably opportunities there to, to, to revisit how that money is done. And again, it's not the sole responsibility of departments for communities or from the ESD. You have every other department buying them, but maybe not paying them <laughs> as they should be. Uh, you, you touched on issues of planning there in terms of it being an impediment uh, to getting houses built. It'll, the same will apply to Stadia. N no doubt, and when planning lies out with the responsibilities of DFC, I would urge you to maybe have a look at the Historic Environment Division, you know, who are statutory consultee in many applications, and I, I think there might be resource issues in there because of the, the length of time that it's taken to respond to consultations is having a, 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 an impact on how quickly schemes can be approved or, or otherwise by councils, and increasingly so in the social housing sector I'm noticing. But uh, I'll leave it at that. There's lots more scribbles. I'm just trying to join the dots here, but I'll save a couple Thank for Thank goodness colleagues. you can't join anywhere dots, Sarah Mark. <laughs> so in response, can I say that um, I know that the view of my team uh, and all of us has been, as we look strategically forward, that this department can be incredibly powerful if and when we use all of some of its parts to address the very issues that we're here to do. Um, and, and, you know, because you know, it's not just about sort of like, you know, even if we're looking at the JBOs now recognising lots of people presenting long term health issues, uh, how do we work with the voluntary community sector into the JBOs? How do we use sport, arts, and culture to address those things? So I think, and again, working with other departments, and Neighbourhood Renewal was way ahead of its time in, in many ways because it was supposed to be a cross government approach. And I agree with you that it actually does need to be reviewed. Um, and I think they, it, there's some, you know, it's a, it's a really, the model, I don't think anyone would disagree that, that you actually have um, the input from the local community and telling us how we do things, but we, we, it, needs, it just needs to be, um, we just need to look at it again in terms of, of, our, of our refresh. Um, what I think you did receive, you didn't get the first, we, what, we, what I gave the minister on the first day, I think you've got now. It was called yeah, got it last issues. night. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so basically that, that, what I did was I thought the danger with this department is that if, if I gave the minister something like this thick, I wanted just to give her the things that really, that we had on our minds that day. There will be a bigger uh, document um, uh, in there as well. And then just one other thing, just um, you mentioned at the start that you were thinking of going and maybe taking the committee out. There's some great things across the department and I would really invite and encourage you to come and visit parts of the, the community's estate when you're having your meetings so that you get, a, it's, the only, it's the only way you really get a feel for things, you know, if you visit, you know, some of them you may have already done so, but if you want us to put forward some suggestions to you, I'd be really happy to do that. Can I just, um, on the first day brief issue, because I see members looking at me as if to say it's not in our packs, even though it came through last night, um, it, it came through to the clerk's office uh, yesterday evening, and I know you had a conversation and we're waiting on an updated version of that, isn't that correct? Well, it's a different piece of, it's a, it's a, so that was, that was actually effectively what the Minister got on the first day, but there's another piece of work being done, which is a much more detailed piece of work, which, yeah, yeah. We're, we're happy to share. So we're us. hoping that we'll get that pretty soon, and if we, yes. if, certainly if we don't have it for next week, we'll have it for the week after. Okay. Yeah. So, but I, was, I would, I, th I, I thought, I thought... I just see that members were looking at me as if to say... Yeah, no, I do, I, I was <laughs> actually, I, I, sorry for that, but, um, as I say, I do think that there's a danger that I would that document will give you a really good insight into very quickly what the big issues are and then you can it's not that the other issues aren't important it's yeah. just those are important yeah. and urgent so that, that's why we, we did it in that way okay Sinead sorry you've been waiting no it's just a quick uh, thanks sure um there's a commitment in new decade new approach to review the number of armed signed bodies within six months is that something uh -huh. that the department are looking at or is that not is that one of the back burner it's it's one of the ones that's in that you're right is in there and um, I, I don't I haven't been given that's yeah. one of the ones that no one said is that going to be looked at how that's going to be looked at um, it's something that we'd be we'd be happy to take forward if the minister wants us to do that um, but as I say I mean we do have 21 ALBs 
So the question is, can we be more efficient or effective, or is the status quo the best option? Um, there was a piece of work done, started to be done previously, which was never finished in this in this respect. I understand before my time, um, so we haven't done a thing on it uh, as yet, or had or had a conversation about it. Just through the chair, I'm just wondering. I know I haven't seen that document that you're talking about, but um, just do you think there will be the expertise within the department to take on some of the the work that those, some of those ALVs are doing? Do you? Oh, you mean to bring it internally? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean. There's, there's a, there's the department actually. This is a, this department does policy regulation and delivery. It is a department that does delivery. Some departments obviously just you know do policy and have bodies to do delivery. Um, I suppose the question is where is it best done? So I do think we have skills to do delivery, but <coughs> not That doesn't necessarily mean it's the right place to do some of that delivery. Um, but those are things we would we would we would have to look at. Um, you know, as we, I mean, for example, there was a reason why some of these arms that were set up to, for expertise. So, you know, um, you know, whether it's the Arts Council, the Sport NI, you know, that that expertise that sits on the on the councils or the boards in there, you know, you you wouldn't have that expertise um, in in the department. So we'd have to think about all of those things. Okay, there are another two members of two short, sub, short, short, short supplementaries because we do have another two briefings to go. We're so excited to have his no. front of us today. We'll just keep you here all day. <laughs> um, Andy? I probably could, Chair, but um, <laughs> I'll refrain from doing so. It's just on this point before we move on, um, and, and I'll caution my comments in this respect, and I know that might cause some people to be concerned. Um, I'm, I'm not leveling the, the blame in respect to this department. It's more, I believe, a fault of us not having a government for three years. Um, I make note of the disability strategy, which obviously expired in 2017. And I just want to sort of place on rec record my extreme disappointment mm -hmm. that that has expired. Yeah. Um, and emphasise the importance of us seeing a properly resourced and meaningful disability strategy coming forward in the very near future. I also note, obviously, there's an evaluation going to the Minister, but it's important that we get that up and running um, as soon as possible, properly resourced, meaningful, to enable individuals with a disability to play a full and fulfilling role in society. And obviously, I declare an interest in that respect, Chair. So, so I think that... Um what we're looking at is some themes which really cut across the department of this inclusivity. And for me, the disability strategy has to be about how we embed that inclusivity across everything we do, as opposed to having it as a, you know, here's a few actions over here. That's how I would like to take these things okay. forward so that, you know, when we, when we, when we go to build a you know, re public realm, we say, you know, have we taken account of the disability sector? When we're, when we're looking at our museums, our libraries, our assets, that we, we at the very front end, as opposed to then sort of trying to retrofit things at the back end. Absolutely. So certainly that's the approach that I that, that we had been intending to, to take, and, and so and that's what we'll be advising. This is all about making sure that there is you know inclusivity at the heart of everything that we that we do. Thank you. Okay, Kelly, you want just to very briefly? quickly. It's on arms length bodies as well. Can I just say about the disability strategy? It's not just for communities; it's for everything. Because mm -hmm. um, I want to see some yeah. departments improving significantly on that. Um, but I was just thinking about the arms length bodies. We talked earlier about the review of the housing executive. Um, I'm not mad keen on us creating more arms length bodies for the sake of it. We've seen how it worked in education when they tried the sectoral bodies all to come together. Um, hasn't exactly achieved as much as we'd hoped, but I'm just concerned that whatever the review of arm's length bodies would have to be taken into consideration with whatever we're going to do with the housing executive, um, because there's no point in having an arm's length body making policy when the department's there to do that. No, um, we, there would, it would be, um, uh, if, if we, I suppose the question is about sort of things like the stuff the housing executive presently does around allocations and things like that. Well, the disabled facilities grant would be yeah. one. Wow. So, yeah. So we just, these things all have to be looked at. Yeah. yeah. Okay, members, content now. Can we can move on then? Is it Jackie? Are you going to you go next, or it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll either on. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, supporting people group. Um, it has three main areas of responsibility. We have a role in relation to providing support to the elderly, to um, the those with disabilities and their carers, and to children through both to deliver the social security benefits that we administer and manage and also the child maintenance service. 
Um, we also have a responsibility in relation to the protection of public funds, and that is through both our work on fraud and error, um, and also the debt recovery work that we do within the department. And finally, we provide a business support service for the welfare aspect of the business, but all of the department as well, and that's through our IT systems, um, data security, information management, and also the management of the estate that DFC uses, which is quite considerable. But we have staff in about 74 locations right across Northern Ireland. The level of spend within um, the business area, we spend about four and a half this year, we're forecasting about four and a half billion spend, Amy spend on benefits. Um, that's your pensions, your disability benefits, your carers' benefits. Um, our resource spend is about £116 million. Pounds. We have almost 3,000 staff within the group. Our key priorities within supporting people. On the, the benefits side, one of the, the key priorities we have, obviously, is the operational readiness for the delivery of the welfare supplementary payments, that's your mitigations. So we've, you know, the legislative process is well underway. We need to be in a position now to be able to continue to deliver those benefits from the 1st of April, and we're well placed to do that. You'll know that this week there was an announcement about the appointment of Marie Kavanagh to take forward the second independent review of personal independence payment and we also hope to publish a report shortly on progress against the recommendations that came through in the first um, review taken forward by Walter Radar. The second review, um, Ms Kavanagh's review, will be um, laid in the Assembly by the 20th of June, so that's the time frame that we're working to on that. Um, the administrative review on personal independence patents payment, which um, followed through from a judicial review in GB, that is well progressed now, almost complete. Um, and there's been uh, by October, we'll, we'll again give you more updated figures shortly on where we are with that. But by October, we had actually reviewed 128,000 um, PIP cases, um, and so it's it's well progressed. We'll also be developing a strategy on um, fraud, debt, and error in terms of the department's approach to that. On in relation to child um, maintenance. We have two sides to the business, we have two aspects to the business. We um, provide a child maintenance service obviously for customers in Northern Ireland, but we also, through a service level agreement, provide a service for Department of Work and Pensions for GB. And on both, in both aspects of the business, about 90, over 90% 90 of um, our parents are, are paying, so more than 9 out of 10 parents are paying. And in, locally in Northern Ireland, we're supporting, there's about 17,500 children benefiting as a result of that. Um, we're also looking at historic debt, and I think you're going to be looking at regulations after this yeah. session in relation to the compliance and arrears strategy um, with child maintenance service. Um, on Make the Call, we've touched on that already. Um, we reached our target this year is to reach 30,000 people by the end of this financial year. It's an important service both in relation to um, you know, allowing um, people to access benefits that they may be entitled to, to access other services provided by other public service organisations. But just touching on, on the, the issues that you've raised about the transformational potential of, of Department for Communities and those connections that, that we have in the wider programme for government. We are also looking at you know, what the outcomes that we're achieving through the Make the Call service are beyond that financial dimension. And there are real benefits starting to come through in terms of you know, the support that's providing people, the connections, the social impacts that it has there as well. In relation to the, the corporate and the support services that we provide, um, obviously a major aspect of our business is supporting the delivery of the welfare systems, welfare pay benefit payments. And um, we, unlike the other departments, we also maintain um, IT infrastructure that you know is used by the Department of Work and Pensions as well. Um, but we have our own bespoke systems too to deliver the like of the, the mitigation payments, the welfare supplementary payments. Data protection is a major issue for the department. Um, we huge hold, or we hold huge files <coughs> on sensitive personal information. So GDPR and our responsibilities there are something that's very very important to us and take very seriously, obviously. And our estate, um, what we're looking at as well, our, our focus looking ahead is 
<coughs> supported both through that, that corporate aspect of our business is to make sure that how we deliver the services, how our, you know, our customers, the people who use our services can access them, it, that they're designed on a basis that suits their need and that we can use multiple channels. So, you know, we are ready for some services through online, still Facebook based, telephone based services, and we're constantly looking at how we can improve that and make that product better fit for the, the user need. But we're also looking at just the, the use of our facilities as well and how they're designed to meet um, our customers' needs as well. And again, it's an important, you know, that we have a reach right across Northern Ireland in terms of um, the access to the services and the, the physical presence of um, the department across Northern Ireland. That's a very high, I'm conscious you, your time this morning, that's a very high level overview and maybe Chair would it be more useful if, we, if you wanted to ask questions based on the well, I'm sure there I'm around. sure there'll be a few questions for you Jackie. You. Um, before I bring members in, thank you for that. Um, I just want to um, uh, talk about the, the Make the Call um, programme. Um, for me, as a constituency MLA, it has been fantastic, mm -hmm. really, really good. Um, we have a, a guy who works in our area, and I'll say his name, Stuart. He has been amazing. Um, we keep his card actually pinned to our computers in the office um, because he, he, he has gone over and above on many occasions in, in certainly helping us um, with information. But he's also, um, and I know it's the same probably across the board, when it comes to maybe going out to speak to a, a, a luncheon club or a, a men's shed or, you know, more than happy to do that. It has been really good. I sat on DSD committee, I think, way back when, when that was introduced. And at the time, we thought this is a really good idea. Um, only one slight concern around it, and that is just the, you know, how widespread do people know about it? I know we know about it in our offices, and various other organisations will know about it, and we'll be able to say, oh, I know exactly how to phone there, and, uh, you know, and we'll get that done. I, I remember at the time, was it, there was a lot, and I do see it still on the TV and hear it on the radio, that there is a campaign there, and I know there's a campaign. Um, but it's just if, I don't know, uh, we can reach that further out, uh, that would be good, and that is, you know, maybe a case of um, contacting all of those social services offices and various other offices um, within the public <coughs> sector and saying, look, don't forget we're here, and we're here to assist you as well and help you, because um, uh, it, it, I, took, I just want to, you know, maybe if you could look at that and maybe stretch that a bit further, but actually just to say really well done with it. Chair, thank you, and I'll also pass your comments back to Stuart because that's that's really positive. Yeah. Thank you very much for for that feedback. There, we will be having another um, you know advertising campaign, media campaign shortly to continue to raise awareness of Make the Call. But you definitely, we'll follow through in the point you're raising about that contact. Worth mentioning as well that we're looking very proactively as well the skills that we have in this area and the, and the expertise in this area, how we could work with other departments potentially. And again, it's back to your point, Kelly, about the working together and that collaborative approach to make sure that we're delivering those outcomes. So I thank you. I take those points on And board. just on another issue again, I want to praise you. Um, again, as constituency MLA, whenever we go through the, the member's telephone number to the department to speak on any of the benefit issues, uh, again, that we don't have to go through that rigmarole of getting <coughs> consent, and which, which we do with other departments, yeah. like the housing executive, where the person has to be sitting beside you yeah. before they'll speak to you. Um, but it, it's good to know that there is a, that dedicated helpline number for elected representatives, um, because quite often you're dealing with clients who have phoned you, who are not necessarily sitting in front of you, so and you, you can't wait that extra 24 hours to get a benefit <laughs> query sorted. So again, I, they're very helpful. And um, I, I just want to, to praise them also for the work that they have done. Been very in the last, certainly the last three years, but without an assembly, they have continued to um, act proactively and engage very well with assembly members. So I just want to put that on record also. Um, so before I bring members in, I have Robin, then I have Mark, and then I have Johnny. So Robin, can I just say, Chair, I think you have said of everything that I was going to say. Um, I do find it extremely helpful. Just a, 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 and I'm not going to go into the other areas, but just a short query on the make the call. Uh, your very last line on your slide says calls generated 
additional benefits, is that, or total benefits? Additional benefits. Additional benefits. It's entitlement that individuals would have had that they weren't aware that they yeah. had, so it was making those connections and making sure that they could have access to those yeah, benefits. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, and to reiterate what the, what the Chair has said, uh, you've developed your partnerships with a number of, uh, of, of other bodies. It would be good, I think, if uh, joined upness could be established with, say, the Health uh, Department in some way, shape or form, because I think the Chair would agree with me, many of the people who are on benefits, it's not just a benefits problem, it's a wider problem uh, than that. Yeah, but but I agree, you. Chair, with uh, your you. comments. Thank you, Robin. Mark? Uh, thank you, Chair. It was really supplementary to your own uh, line of question and our observations on the Make a Call campaign. I'm sure you have a geographical breakdown and see where calls are coming from or maybe more interesting where they're not, mm -hmm. but if it would be possible to do a tailored, specific targeting campaign in those areas where there hasn't really been much or as much interest or uh, uptake uh, in, in terms of staff, it is great that people generally are very helpful when, when you can get through them, which isn't that difficult uh, with regard to specific constituent queries. Uh, it's been a very difficult couple of years for frontline staff, I can imagine, given all the uncertainty that there has been out there around welfare reform, about mitigations coming and going, coming back. You know, uh, so it has been very difficult. Are you confident that, that the staff have all been received the requisite training? I suppose to know exactly where we are and, and how fluid that training is, as, as, as situations fluid and things are changing. Are, are they kept kept abreast of it? Because we have had situations regularly enough, I have to say, where people come to our office, the benefits office, because <coughs> they're sent there. They're sent, they're sent to us from the That's office right. because it'll be a more strategic sort of issue. Mm -hmm. um, Colin will maybe touch on that in more detail, but uh, both in relation to the benefits aspect of the business of delivery and the make the call, any aspect of our, our work, the training and investment and training staff is critical. And you're right, there is off, an awful lot of change within the systems, both in terms of the rules themselves and the systems that we use. So it is something that is, is of, of prime um, importance to us. In relation to make the call, that's a very um, you know, expert team in terms of understanding across the board, in relation to being able to help people and to be able to respond to questions as well. But, uh, Colm, do you want to say anything at this point on it? Yeah, I mean, I, I can see the point you're making. I can see it in the, in the complaints that we that we get. Um, we don't get that many complaints. Probably about 1,000 in the last year for the department, about probably 900 of those sat in the benefits area. Um, they from staff? <laughs> <laughs> they just give it to us face to face. Yes. Uh, the, the, the complaints, actually, we, we follow up on that and we look at what, what the causes are. So it allows us to, to track back to see are there areas where staff have a difficulty understanding some of the stuff. One of the, th one of the things, for example, is that the universal credit system itself is an agile system. The system updates every day, every week, every day. So um, you're always in a continuum um, with the systems changing, the IT changing, uh, the guidance changing. There's a lot for people to, to, to stay up a pace with. Every week you find a new fault. Yeah, <laughs> so we, we, are, we are good at it, uh, but we're not perfect at it. So there'll be times, there'll be things that'll get past us but just to, to reiterate what Jackie said, we, have a, we invest hugely in, in, in learning and development for our staff. We do a lot of stuff about resilience training and leadership training and a lot of wider stuff that staff are really gravitating towards. But we also do benefit-specific training as well. So if there are particular areas where people need more tailored stuff, they get that. And if there are particular customers that they're dealing with where they need to specialise more, then we do that as well. So it can be things like dealing with mental health issues, uh, disability, um, alcohol, drug abuse, all those sorts of things that are coming to our front door um, that staff need to be better aware of. So we continuously do that. We're also working through an accreditation process for our advisors as well, for our work coaches, so that there's a level of professionalism now that we're looking for. And we're part of a, a wider uh, operational delivery profession now as well, which is, which is GB White. Um, and again, that gives staff an understanding of where they sit and they've got 
operational skills which are portable across different organisations and the NICS now as a consequence of that. But we're very much at the starting post with that. Brilliant comment. And if I can just touch on maybe one specific issue mm -hmm. where, where people have been sent to me over the past week or two uh, by staff who have a dilemma and it's around the uh, entry criteria for nursery places mm -hmm. and, and school places and the, the social need and how that's measured. So I think you can take the box if you're in receipt of universal credit, mm -hmm. but if you're still on legacy benefits and haven't migrated over, the computer says no. Right. So there are people in receipt of universal credit who are, let's say, better off mm -hmm. financially than some of the people still on some of the legacy benefits. And, and it's putting staff in an invidious position. They can't stamp the form because the person's not yeah, well, we'll to have to look at that, but, but obviously, I have a question on the yeah. post ministers, communities yeah. and education about that. I mean, the deadline for admissions is, is tomorrow. Well, that, that, we've, had, we've written the skills yeah. on it and governors, but I don't know. And there's a wider point on that, though, is the longer that uh, the migration from legacy benefits into universal credit is delayed, the more yeah. things, I guess, will come, come, yeah. come, come up. So we do need a way to work through some of those things. I wasn't aware of that actually until you raised it. So, yeah. but again, we'll have a look at it when we come back. Yes, um, Chair, it's maybe worth mentioning because Colm touched on complaints and, and your questions. You know, very relevant in the same area. We invest a lot of time in looking at complaints. <coughs> Looking at, you know, it's bringing in the official error aspect of things. Are there things that we're doing directly? Are there things that we need to address through training and investing in training? But also that customer experience as well. So the people using our services, are we gathering intelligence now through looking at complaints or talking to, to people who have used the service that we can look at how we can make it an easier process for them? But it's a very, that kind of constant, you know, looking at the feedback that's coming through the various different channels for both training and the services we deliver is critically important to us. Thanks. Okay, okay Mark. Uh, John? <coughs> Thank you, Chair. And it's just a, again a supplementary to what you had mentioned in relation to make the call wrap around. Um, and, and you mentioned, Jackie, in terms of you're going to be looking at further advertisement of that yeah. across the board. Um, as a newer member, um, it, it's not a service that I would have been a fair with or, or had experience with, um, but I quickly have come to learn that, that, that it is very important. Um, but I, I just think maybe if you're talking about targeting and how to agree with what the Chair's comments say is how widely is it actually known. And, and I think maybe a good starting point for anyone would be much more engagement not only with MLAs but wider elected representatives because normally they're the first port of call for many of these people trying to access services. So uh, I'm not sure if, if that's something that you can look at, yes. but I think more direct contact uh, with MLAs and staff and wider elected officials, whether that's councillors or whatever, mm -hmm. will help to get the word out there in relation to the services that are already in place. And just to pick up on Johnny's point, I know certainly, again, Stuart in my area, um, he contacted us <coughs> and said, you know, can I come in and speak to you about this and brief you on this, which was great. Um, and then uh, and then I said, would you speak to your councillors as well in the area? And it was, yes, absolutely. So and I think that's a good, a good approach. Yeah, it I is a good be. approach yeah. if you have. And perhaps, Chair, it's you, Tracy touched on it. Maybe it's an area the committee would like, you know, to actually come out and, and meet the team yeah. or, you know, yeah. or even at a local area, you yeah. know, come along and, and see and maybe some sort of... Yeah. I, th I think that, to the Chair, I think that's a fantastic idea because it's only for it's hearing experiences of which the Chair has mentioned with a local member of staff. That's, that's something that I would like to see replicated in my own area. Um, to try and build on the success story that Make the Call Rapper Round has been. But I, th I think it's so important now that um, the lines of the communication aren't blurred because very often it, it becomes, and I, I can account for my own office, but a, a heavy load now on the constituency service is access and the, the, the guidance required to go through some of the documentation that they need to do. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to sort of bring you back to PIP. I know you said that the review is going going. I was going to wonder, as part of that review, is the appeals process going to be looked at? Um, I, when we talk about mental health affecting people across the piece, um, using courthouses for the appeals service is really devastating. I don't know many people I've had in tears, men, women. It, it, courthouses are terrifying places. I don't even like going into it to, to go with an appeal. Um, I'm just wondering if that's going to be covered in that. Also, the contract for the assessments, 
Um, is that due for <coughs> renewal soon? I, I know it was extended, but when's that contract due up and when, when will that um, pace be going forward for finding a new supplier? Okay, on both those areas, Chair, you're going to be receiving a briefing okay. next week on those. Right. Touching it very quickly, the administrative review of PIP isn't looking at the, you know, the, the courthouses and the location of where the, the appeal service itself. It's looking at um, those customers who have lifelong um, conditions in terms of a, an ongoing um, entitlement to benefit with like a 10 year review point built in. So it's, it's not getting into that aspect of the business. There, the contract for the assessments you know, is coming to a point in terms of you know, reconsidering the way forward in terms of procurement. You'll get a briefing on that next week on a bit more detail um, in relation to the, it's currently um, a minister per capita, the assessment process. Thank you. That's Can okay. I just say about complaints, um, I worked in, in the community voluntary sector for not saying how long, but may involve two decades. Um, people don't make as many complaints as you think, um, and especially when it comes to services, because they're absolutely terrified of what will happen because they have complained. Um, and I have to say, my office is inundated with complaints about the system. And when I push people to go forward, you know, to help to the system to grow and to learn, they just will not do it. And I'm just wondering, will there be a facility within complaints that a third party can take forward a complaint on behalf of someone? not just for complaints sake, but to help the system to grow. We actually have a dissatisfaction yeah. process, even yeah. it starts before the formal complaint, so there's, there's nothing to stop people coming through. And, I, I, and what you are alluding to is we would have a trust issue, we would have a trust that I raise something, there's nothing going to be, there's going to be to come back on me. There's, there's genuinely no issue with that, so yeah. Yeah. we get a lot of dissatisfaction queries coming through where people aren't quite sure, is this a complaint or is it not a complaint? And the time we worked out through, a lot of them actually aren't. Sorry. So we see a lot of that as well, but it's it's I find that for me it's 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 a bit of it's feedback, yeah. and it's important feedback, and it helps us tune things up. Is that the um, sort of thing then you want MLAs to do? Because some of the people, yeah. it's they don't want the, the hassle of it. They don't, they're a bit afraid of the process. These are people who are quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They maybe have been turned down for a benefit, and they've come to us looking for help. Um, but it's just our feedback to yourselves. And More than happy to see stuff coming through from MLAs on on, on complaints. There's no issue with that at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Kelly. Andy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, just, just further to uh, Kelly's point on the PIP review, Jackie, um, will that include the, the terminal illness aspect of it? I know the Minister mm. said that she was open to reviewing the terminal illness aspect. Not the, the review, that no. doesn't include that, but okay. Colm, I think you're going to touch on yeah, well, the, I, I, the I deal with, I can deal with it now, Andy. Yeah. I mean, um, Minister wants to do a wider review, looking at, um, I suppose, a whole range of mitigations, but a whole other things as well outside of that, which um, I think deserves special consideration, and this is this is clearly one of them. There's been a, a very strong groundswell of opinion that over, over a long period of time. She has spoken to us about it, and she does want to, to have a look at it. Um, so I think they'll probably she'll probably come back here and talk about what she wants to do. So I'd imagine there will be there will be a, a piece of work on that. Um, we've already been looking at it. Yeah. Any, in any case, and we're, we've been feeding input uh, through to her on that. I suppose my own, my only concern around that is is and I, and I get the I get the drive for it, uh, but there's a, a, a missed understanding. You talked earlier about about how well we sell things out there and market things. What we do, one of the things we don't market particularly well is how excellently our people on the PIP side can actually do those terminal illness cases, and I'm talking about to turnaround of days. I'm talking about a form never even needing to be filled in and the face to face assessment not being required. Yeah. So it's maybe one of the best hidden secrets we've got. Uh, but I think it's worth it's worth a, a look at. I know the Minister is really keen to have a further, more detailed look at that. I know she wants to look at the wider situation as well and she's going to t take consideration around that. The other thing I would say is that whole issue there is a judicial review going on around that space. Mm. So in terms of any specifics, we need to be very, very careful in terms of expressing any opinions or views on it. But just in terms of the process, in terms of the capabilities that we currently have, I think those capabilities are misunderstood. And I think those capabilities could drive forward very, very significantly to, to provide a superb service in the meantime, whilst there's further consideration given to a wider review of, of, of what's going on. And the only other piece I would say is, I know we've, we've studied Scotland in this, and we're looking at where, where they're going, and, and, and the view of extending out to two years from six months. Um, a lot of money involved in that. They're talking about an estimate over £300 million pounds for the two-year period, a year for the two-year period. So it would be uh, a big concern about how costly that actually is. So I think 
uh, for me is critical. And, and I know we've been talking to the minister about this, and I know she'll, she'll want to do to take her own mind on this and, and, and take a, a view of the overall picture. But it's critical that people genuinely do understand what we are capable of doing. And I think there's a lot of really strong stuff in there we could do in the interim, you know. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and then certainly we'll engage with the minister on any reviews she's bringing forward and, uh, and support her in that. And there's a lot of engagement with the sector as well, in terms of just any sort of their views on the experiences of the people they represent in terms of what can we do in terms of delivering the service within the rules that exist at this point in time and the legislation as it stands. So again it's that constant just looking at you know how we're delivering the service and how we can make it, you know, better suited to the needs of the people who use the service. And, and Jack, if we can just uh, move on to the information services slide, um, and, and one aspect of that being universal credit, and one of the challenges being the scale of work program. Um, are you confident? Obviously, and I asked this of the minister, and, and, and she'd give us a commitment also in the chamber on Monday in respect of obviously we're we're transitioning um, across on a certain aspect of claimants across the universal credit now, but we'll be moving to. Um, the full rollout, are you confident within the department that you have the capacity to be able to deliver that with no undue impact on claimants? Yes, well there's there's two elements to it, there's the, the infrastructure dimension mm -hmm. to it in terms of the systems, there's the, the actual rollout of the, the surface itself. Um, we work very closely with DWP in terms of the IT infrastructure that we use for benefits. It's challenging for us, um, you know, there's constant change within the, the, the software itself um, as benefits change. You see is obviously a challenge for us and you know you see over the last few years has represented a challenge not just in terms of the IT infrastructure but accommodation, redesign of the accommodation in terms of our jobs and benefits offices at a local level. But yes, you know, we, we are we we're planning ahead for this. We we have a programme in place to make sure that the systems are there to support the rollout of the service as we progress through that. Colm, do you want to say anything? There's obviously the training with staff and you know, any aspects in that. Yeah, I think I think there's a, a briefing on its own for this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to be totally yeah. honest, there's a lot of depth and breadth to this one, <coughs> um, and I'd like to to, to, maybe to to take the chance to sort of set their stall out so you, you, you get it all in one go. Um, but are we confident about delivering what we have to deliver? Yeah, we are. Uh, are there gaps? There are. Are there concerns we have in accommodation? Yes. Um, will the, will the system stand up to it? I mean, so far with so far in terms of what DWP have delivered, it's, it's been great. I mean, Christmas time we had to deliver an extra piece there, so we were able to do automated payments to private, private sector landlords. Uh, first Christmas we've, we've had that, made a huge, huge difference. And I have to say DWP in terms of supporting Northern Ireland has absolutely been superb in terms of, of, of their responsiveness. And you've got to bear in mind that they've got a huge list of things, for, of all other sorts of things that they need to do for themselves, never name us. You know, they bumped us up the queue quite a few times, mm. uh, and Christmas was one of those as well. It just is probably just worth making the point that uh, whilst there are frustrations in working on a system which is not our own, there is also huge advantages. This system we just couldn't possibly have afforded as a region. It is very complex. There's you know millions and millions and millions of pounds are spent on it yeah. in terms of that the uh, big issue around data security. So yes, it's challenging at times, but actually. The fact that we are running on the back of that system has been a huge benefit for us um, that, that we just couldn't have done by ourselves. And just, just further on that point, it was another point I was going to uh, raise in relation to DWP, and, and I appreciate that they've been supportive um, and they probably recognise somewhat the difficulty we had in respect of not having um, the assembly up and running, although that wouldn't have made uh, a big impact in many respects. So uh, the DWP has been receptive towards um, amendments and changes to the IT infrastructure and system in terms of uh, learning curves that we're getting from um, the UC claimants. Are they receptive to those changes being embedded within their, their the, system? The, what you have to do is negotiate a slot. It's like, it's like in the aircraft out of Heathrow, you've got to find your slot. Okay. Uh, and then you find your slot gets bumped and then it gets bumped again and bumped again and bumped again because it's all very dynamic. But they never lose sight of the value of this for us. Um, and in terms of delivering, for example, the Northern Ireland flexibility, the Universal Credit Programme would, would tell you if they were here how responsive they were to our needs around all of that. Uh, and I have to say, I, 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 Neil Cooling heads up the programme and his commitment, his personal commitment to us, and the reception we get when I sit in the Universal Credit Programme uh, board for GB, uh, and the, the commitment and support we get there, second to none. It's absolutely phenomenal. But we do also, if you know, through the delivery of services, 
are you setting aside the IT, the actual services themselves? If we come, become aware of anything locally, we will, you know, talk to DWP about that because if you think about it, Northern Ireland represents, you know, we're we're a small unit and compared to the scale that they operate, and quite often you can see things coming through locally here that you know maybe of relevance on a wider scale. And now, you know, as Colin has said, these are huge systems, complex systems. Um, but you know, it's not just within the benefits of the fraud and error front, and the, you know, as well. If we're starting to see patterns emerging, we will talk to DWP about that. You know, so sometimes there's lessons learned from our perspective that can help on a wider front as well. Okay, and and just the final point I would make in, on the same slide is extending mitigations, and obviously we've we've made our commentary around that and the importance of it. But there's a challenge listed as supply specialist staff. Um, is that an area that is going to be a big impact in respect to that when the Minister makes her decision in terms of existing mitigations, the legislative ones, the, the regulatory ones and any potentially new ones? Are we going to have any issues in that, that area? That's in the context of the yep. IT systems okay. and, and you know having the systems ready to roll. Okay. But, but we're flagging up there as it's something we've recognised and we're, we're managing and planning. Uh, for you know, so no, it's it, we'll be, we are you know on track to make sure that the systems are there to deliver the medications beyond the, the first of March. So it's, it's just part of our term, in terms of subject subject matter experts, um, we're very content that we got the right uh, learning and development mechanisms in place, and we're refining that all the time. So um, we do want to have specialisms in each of the offices where people are the champions for particular areas. We've watched that happen across the water and it works very, very well. So we'd like to we'd like to, to, to repeat that here. So there's there's further iterations around that that we're doing. Yeah. And just one final point very quickly, and I know Tracy you'll you'll know I raised this with you um, when you first came in to post the discretionary support line um, and we discussed the, the time frame and what's for claimants. And I know you may not be able to answer this here now, but I just want to flag it again. Um, when the individuals are ringing through, certainly in my own office and collectively themselves, the, the time frame in which for them to get through is still um, quite extensive. Um, some, some of them indicating the meeting <coughs> an hour before they can get through to um, the, the team. Andy, I'll take that one. I, I look after the, the discretionary support in, in Antrim and Dungannon. Mm -hmm. I was down uh, with them, but in Antrim quite a few times. I live quite close by, so I can drop in and, and I, I listen to calls. Um, and you listen to someone come on a, on a discretionary support call for the first time, and they're 45 minutes in, and they haven't got through the, biogra the biographical information at that stage. Yeah. What, what the point I'm making is actually waiting for their call to but, be actually taken. But even when they get through, I don't understand that. But even when they do get through, it's like trying to get into a big funnel. But even yeah. when they get through, the length of time the call takes itself, yeah. which, which is concerning me even more. Yes. So one of the things that we've agreed to do. Um, is to have a look at how the, the system actually works. So what we're trying to do is actually take the call, do triage in the call, and do a call back to the customer okay. once we've actually done the analysis of what they need. That's a short-term measure. Okay. In terms of the longer term, that means more calls get through, less, less wait time as well as you've described. What we also want to do around that as well is I think digitally is where we need to go with this. Uh, and we'd like to create an online system for this. And I think we could do that. It'll take a bit of time to do it. But for me, improving the telephony uh, capacity is, is the first thing. Um, and we've been all over that for the last few weeks. So we've, 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 I mean, I've watched it, I've seen it, we've listened to the feedback, and we're changing that as, as fast as we can. So we've been doing a fair bit of experimentation over recent weeks. And again, you're very welcome to come down to see discretionary support, either in Dungannon or Antrim. I have a good feed to see it. Happy to do um, so. And the team there are very committed, um, very focused on what they're doing. And they realise the importance of what they're doing. So there's a frustration about losing coal. Yeah, and uh, one, one final point, just sorry, if I may, just um, because we had identified the need for the mitigations extensions, I've been looking at about a million options of how we could do that. Um, one of the things we did um, was we made sure that the I we made investment in the IT systems at risk to ensure that whenever it got to a stage where we found a mechanism to do it, that we couldn't not do it. If you know what I mean? So. That, that means that whenever now that we have got a mechanism, we're actually the, the IT systems have been invested in, the help, nothing has fallen away for that. So that's that obviously helps. Okay, I have two members that want to come back before we move on. Colin, do, you, do your briefing, um, Kelly, and then Johnny. Just very quickly on the IT system, we've obviously exited the European Union. The data protection issue is a big 
I love data protection. It really makes my day. Um, but I'm just thinking about the child, you know, maintenance and, and so on. Is, our, is the DWP system able to handle the unique situation of Northern Ireland and the cross-border issues that it presents for us? Yes, this is an area we've been looking at from IT systems and also data sharing, which yeah. is another dimension <coughs> where information is held. You know, if it's held in the European Union, it's not unique to us. It's a NICS-wide issue that's been taken forward by um, Department of Finance, but we've been working with them, and you know, we're you know assured in terms of the situation when we leave um, after the transition year. But it is something that has been a priority for not just us, but all of the NICS. Okay, thank you. Hey, Johnny. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question. I know in uh, priorities about the, the PIP review, and a concern that I just want to put a, a, on record, and I'm sure many other members have this problem as well, was the access to medical information required yes. for a uh, PIP appeal, because it's not a level playing field. Yeah. We have some of the larger practices that are not supplying the information uh, to the applicant. Whereas maybe in other practices, the, the, the practice is different. They, they do and are quite forthcoming and helpful. But I don't see how this uh, is helpful in terms of an, an equal playing field and giving people the proper opportunity to have their, their hearing heard. It's a massive issue right across the country from, from what I can see here, by members. So I just would like to take that on board. Okay. Thank you. I know we have swerved in and out column of your, of your presentation Can I just check with you? How long, how long do you want me to take here? Because I can cut this whatever length you want. Um, a little well, longer than two hours. Yeah. <laughs> well, the last time I gave this presentation, it took two hours. Well, <laughs> two hours is maybe just a, a little bit, bit, bit long. Bit. So what we, what we... I mean, I think the, sorry, can, the, obviously these things are... The first stage is going to take longer than maybe we had yeah. anticipated, and mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, just in terms of the next couple of briefings that we'd said three were coming up, which someone might want to consider what way you want to do that, whether you indeed want to actually break them down into sort of the various components parts when we have the comp because maybe we were a little bit ambitious today. Yeah, and I, I think we were all a little bit ambitious today because we were just so eager to get some answers to some questions that have been looming for a little while. Okay. Um, I can counter over the ground here in five minutes and then take, a, and take questions. Of I think then as questions unfold, then yeah. it, it, you yeah. can expand then on that's various okay. issues. That's fine, that's fine. Um, what, what you have in terms of the pack there, um, there's, there's probably more information than I normally provide on a, on, a, on, a, on a brief, but I just wanted you to see I suppose what we gave the minister. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted you to understand that we've been very transparent here around that. The minister was very happy for us to do that. Um, can I say first of all, just thank you for the warmth of the welcome today. Yeah. Uh, that's been fantastic. Um, and thank you for your comments on our staff. I think the directors and managers and staff, we're incredibly proud of them all. They've done a superb job, not just over the last three years, but they've done a brilliant job for a long, long time here. So um, thank you for that. We, we're, we're very proud of them. Um, it also says something about our staff, the fact that they never want to leave either. Most of our staff stay for 20 odd, maybe 30 odd years doing the same sort of stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vocation for many people. Um, and uh, I just thank, thank you for your, for your comments on that. So the other thing I just want to say as well, our minister said several times that she's a minister of people. Um, and that's something that kind of resonates with us as well, because when you think about that, we deal with people every single day. Our staff are there to serve, and I think they serve to the best of their ability and, 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 and by and large serve very, very well. And we know that from seeing sur independent surveys of, of from, from, from people who come through our doors and what they think of our staff and what they think of the services provided. And we're happy to share that, 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 that data with you. It's, it, it's, it speaks very, very well of how well they do their jobs. So in that context, um, that's where, where we are. And the other wee thing, I just want to give you a wee piece of feedback. We're delighted to have a minister and we're delighted to have you back. Uh, and and I say that with, with uh, in, in all sincerity because I know Anne sitting behind me probably she's still there. We've been working, we've been working through bedroom tax uh, and mitigations and trying to come up with a legislative vehicle to allow us to extend this. Uh, we were going through so many different creative modes over the last 12 to 15 months. Uh, so thank you for being here to allow us to do this the right way. So that's, that's, that's really positive. Um, in terms of, of the brief, uh, there's a fair bit of background in there in terms of Social Security Policy and Legislation Division. The, the, the guys have been camped here with you, I think, over the last couple of weeks, so I know you, you probably know them any better than I do at this stage. Uh, that first slide, I just wanted to, to reiterate the point about the Northern Ireland Act, six sections 87 and 88, and the point that 
were fully funded for benefit costs so long as parity is maintained. But once we step outside of that, then the Northern Ireland Bloc becomes liable. So that's a, 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 something we've always got to be very, very conscious of. Something we're very, very conscious of in our briefings and something we're conscious of in terms of how we do things. That's not to, to dampen our ambitions, and that's not to dampen our ambitions to do things outside of how GB do things, because I think discretionary support is a perfect example of that. The Universal Credit Contingency Fund is a very good example of that. And another good example is in terms of the Northern Ireland flexibilities around UC, which I think the Assembly should be very proud of in terms of, of bringing those things forward. So we have that ambition and we, we do want to take, to take that forward. We know at the minute, in terms of the, the welfare reform legislation, that powers need to still come back from Secretary of State to here, uh, and the process is underway to, to look at how, how that's going to be done. Welfare uh, mitigation schemes, um, great to have uh, forward progression, particularly on the bedroom tax. Um, very conscious we just need to nail down the pounds, shillings and pence to deliver that and you get the, to get the legislation over the line as well. Good confidence around both of those, really good confidence around both of those. Um, but you never shout to the, you have the money in the bank as they say, so uh, we're, 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 we're very, very confident around that. Um, other stuff in there around the Assembly Pensions Bill and the Westminster, Westminster Pensions Schemes Bill, both of those are important pieces. Uh, we, we put those in front of our Minister very early on, and I know the guys are working very closely with it. And in terms of the Westminster Pensions Bill, it's already had a second meeting in, in Westminster, so it's, again, it's moving in the right direction. Um, moving closer to home uh, and stepping away from, from what SSPLD do, um, um, SSPLD are... I, I know you've seen their professionalism here. Uh, they have kept us afloat in, ter in terms of so many of the legislative changes that had to be made over the last three years. But they're also very creative as well at helping us to plan our way forward around the party issues and to see what we can do. Um, there are links with NIO, there are links with DWP, uh, absolutely fundamental to how, we, to how we do things. So they're really, really good. So, down into some of the bread and butter stuff underneath the policy and the legislation. <coughs> Universal credit operations, big operation. Um, resource budget, £66 million to 2,000 staff. Three service centres move into a fourth service centre because the three can't cope. Um, and we'll, we'll talk to you again about that, where that fourth one's going to be. Um, 35 jobs and benefits offices. Um, the makeup of, of, of Universal Credit is a lot of, I mean, a, a, a lot of negative press about UC. Um, but I have to say, watching talk, watching our work coaches in action, talking to how, talking to them about how they do what they do, uh, and seeing the issues that they are dealing with coming in through the door, uh, they deal with it all extremely well. And I know most of the issues that people have with universal credit are policy issues, are issues about how uh, five week waits and, 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 and things like that. Uh, but in terms of, of our ability to make sure that we pay people, 95% of people are paid on time. Um, and we're now outstripping GB slightly in terms of our performance capability around that. Um, that's probably as good as it gets. I don't think with whenever you're, you're, you're trying to get, as a tenant, you're trying to get information from your landlord or get carers information or whatever else, there are, there are time delays and that's what creates that other 5%. But we have that buttoned down, I think, probably as well as we have. And what pleases me are also the, the stats around that first payment that we actually get for those people who don't get their full amount the first time, we get that, the money out to them as, as fast as possible thereafter. I'm not saying UC is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's a, a, a growing, evolving benefit. Um, but in terms of what our coaches are, are saying on the front line, they're seeing people coming in, they're dealing with, with customers with complex needs. In the old world, they would be in the space of, I knew JSA like a bag of my hand. I knew every scheme like a bag of my hand. The system never changed. I knew I knew every 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 rhythm in this in the, in the system, every single thing, and I I could I could fill in with, with my eyes closed. It's so different for them now. But what it does is it allows you to to look at the individual who's coming in to see you, 360, uh, and it allows you to actually address a lot of their needs. And I think it was a frustration initially from a lot of work coaches. This isn't what I signed up to do. But what they needed to realise is before you can actually talk to someone about work, you need to be sure there's a, a level of financial stability before you can actually think about that. Um, and we're starting to see that understanding coming through now. And I think we've actually reached a really positive tipping point where the staff actually get what UC is about in terms of the, the positives. And there are a lot of positives in that policy. And I know there are issues in it as well. Um, but we're seeing uh, a workforce here 
and we're seeing uh, a breakthrough in terms of how we can actually help people uh, to get into work, to stay in work, to get better work. And not only that, we're actually seeing a breakthrough from the same workforce about, well, do you know what? There are people who are nowhere near work who will be coming on to UC in another year's time, two years' time. And we need to think very differently about conditionality. We need to think very, very differently about mandation. Um, so, for example, the days of Steps to Success, Steps to Success as a program is coming near the end of its life. We're not going to extend that program. That program will end this year. Uh, we're not going to replace it. We're going to put in place a new framework. And a new framework that gives people choice for the right things that will work for them in their local community. Instead of saying, you need to go there Monday to Friday and you, we, we will teach you how to, to find a job. There are different ways of doing that, which, we're going to, which I think will be a lot more responsive. And I, I, that in itself is a brief in, a, in, its own, in its own right. But I'm seeing a lot more uh, responsiveness to dealing with vulnerable customers with complex needs. And we have a, 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 a toolkits to help staff deal with that, which again uh, are continuously being reviewed and continuously been, been overhauled. Universal Credit Program, program I take my hat off to it, delivered a lot. Rolled out UC across uh, the 35 offices, to the, to the service centres, um, stood it up very, very well. Um, the, the next issue is this move to UC. So if you're an ESSA customer, if you're IS, um, what does that want to mean for me? How am I going to be transitioned across? There's a, there's a, a pilot of up to 10,000 claimants in GB and Harrogate. It's moving very, very slowly. I'm keeping a very tight eye on it. Um, so I think. For me, and this is something the committee will want to really see, I think for me we need to be very, very clear um, and very focused on what it is we want to do uh, with the move to UC in terms of how we do it. I wouldn't want us to be sitting waiting forever and ever until GB finished what they're doing what they're doing. I think they'll come to a stage I think we should be dabbling in this and testing, and testing the ground out. See, because I think there's a lot of help we can give people. And the longer people sit on legacy benefits, the more those issues you talked about earlier on are going to crop up. Um, so I know people are fearful. Mm -hmm. Feedback is people are fearful of moving across. And I think it's a challenge to try and remove that. To try and remove that fear. Um, our working age services we um, deliver uh, ESA, we deliver legacy JSA and uh, income support as well. We deliver discretionary support, universal credit contingency fund. Um, a lot of that is now starting to erode. So ESA, JSA, IS, they're, they're coming down and down and down as people move across to UC. So we're kind of sitting at a, not a rump at this stage, but near enough. Uh, and that rump won't disappear until uh, we do that move to UC. So we've seen a big changeover of the staff in that space as well. But the service that customers are getting in that is still as good as the day, <coughs> the, day the SS Centre was a year old. So I'm very, very pleased with the performance that, 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 that people are given. Our, Interesting, our service centres and Universal Credit are, are amongst the top five performing service centres across GB. Um, and in terms of the GB work we do, uh, we have that in Ballymena, Lissa Halley, and Belfast. Uh, and the work again, very, very valuable for the economy. Um, good quality jobs, and our staff are, are doing that work very well. So we know DWP are very pleased with the high quality of the work and the calibre uh, of people that we have and the productivity they get through. I mentioned earlier about uh, steps to success. It will go. We're looking at a new work and well-being employability strategy. And Andy, you mentioned disability as a, as a key as a, as a key piece of that. Um, there are a number of areas where we want to address economic inactivity, long-term unemployment, uh, better better opportunities for people with disability, uh, making sure that employers genuinely have a skilled labour supply, and they're not just taking people off the unemployed registers because they have to tick a box. Um, and also the ability to respond to economic shock. We want to make sure we have, we have programs and schemes and provisions in place that allow us to get people into work if something does go wrong. Um, all of the disability services that we have, work with NI, access to work, condition management program, and a closed program, which we have the employment support program, we'll brief you uh, in more detail at a later point. But um, those programs, some of them need a refresh. Uh, I think just some of, these a bit, some of them need a wee bit of modernization in terms of of the sort of jobs that people can go for. And some of those programs haven't changed for maybe 10, 20 years. So I think it's, it's, it's something we want to make sure we go in and, and do that. We're not doing it ourselves. A big word that we hear a lot is co-design. We are genuinely doing co-design work in this. And we've had a what we call an innovation lab with a, um, 
a few months ago with, with uh, the disability sector and a lot of the vulnerable community sector around economic inactivity and disability featured very, very prominently in that, as did childcare. Um, so we're alive to the, the barriers that, that, that people are trying to overcome in terms of, of getting into work and we're very focused and very committed and very exercised to try, to try and address those. Um, that's primarily the, that's the, that's the headlines. So okay. I'm happy to take any questions. No bother. Like, thank you, Colm. And you kind of answered most of what I have um, kind of was thinking in my head that I wanted answered. Um, I, I know that being on the original committee for welfare reform way back when, and I know we had Anne and was it never away from the table during those those months anyway. Um, we had looked at this legislation and we were worried about the legislation and I, I, I still am worried about welfare reform and how that affects um, everyone who, who, who has to avail of it. And one of the, the I know I remember at the time one of the things we were worried about was our staff not using that sort of common sense approach. And uh, you know that yes there is legislation there, there is a format there, there are, is protocols, there are all of those objectives, all of those wonderful words, but they're human beings um, that we're dealing with. Um, and I suppose from listening today, it's given me a little bit of comfort around that, that we do have staff there that are recognising, well, actually, some of these people are not ready for work. Some people need a little bit extra and a bit more time and, uh, and support. And that's good to know, because that was something that, um, at the time, that was a worry to all of us on the old DSD committee, um, you know, that we just can't have staff that just follow a, a, a pro forma. That's because not everyone is the same and all, all clients are different. So that's encouraging to know that. And I, I know certainly as, again, a constituency MLA, um, it, the, the major issues are when it, it, when it to do with um, complaints and various things like that, they are generally around PIP and PIP assessments. And, you know, very rarely it, will it be a complaint to do with anything to do with the, um, the general, general um, the benefits in general, you know, and how people access that. Um, so... That's, that's as comforting. And I'm glad you went into detail, a wee bit of detail there too about the, the delay in the universal credit and how that I mean that is going to affect people here in Northern Ireland. Yeah. And uh, you know, as long as we recognise that and look at you know various um, issues or whatever we have in place to, to to try and mitigate against some of those effects of that delay. It's a frustration for us as well that it's taken so long. I mean, it's I know it's a frustration for for DWP themselves. Uh, yeah. But I think we just need to we just need to work out what it means here. Um, I think there's a, a local view in this that's really, really key. Uh, I think we need to get our heads around that sooner or later. So for me, I think we need to start opening the box up a wee bit because we kind of we kind of sat on tight saying, "Well, just let's watch how this goes across across in Harrogate and see how it works out." Um, and it's just it's not been pacey enough, I think. So we just need to we need to have a, I think we need to open it a little bit more and have a bit more of a dialogue on it. Yeah, look, thank you. I have Johnny, Robin and Emma down so far. Thank you, uh, Colm. Uh, first, firstly, could you maybe elaborate a wee bit? I've noted with interest your comments around the, the steps to success. It seemed to be quite a, na a negative narrative in terms of the reasons for closing. Could you maybe elaborate a, a bit on yeah. the steps to success and why you feel it, it isn't in line to close for something new? I, I, I probably sat in this room um, trying to get the... Um, committee to buy into steps to success. I was the SRO for steps to success. Uh, not, a negative, not, not a negative narrative at all. Thanks for asking the question. Um, and allow me to address that, that, that observation. Steps to success uh, was a program that was developed at a point in time when the unemployment registers were extremely high. Um, and uh, uh, employment levels were around about 61, 62%. Uh, so we needed something uh, effectively, it was a, a Northern Ireland version of the work programme in Britain, uh, and we did a lot of modifications to it. We did a fair bit of co-design on it, and it started off really well. And it actually has outperformed the previous programme we had in Northern Ireland, which is called Steps to Work. Uh, the issue is we're sitting at a stage where we've, we've already got full employment, um, and the providers themselves are struggling to actually make the programme perform the, to the level it should. So. In terms of all the economic projections that we got, uh, the economic projections weren't right. So uh, I'm pleased to say, actually, because it meant employment went, went well up, uh, which meant that you were digging in then to try and to get more people who were economically inactive onto that program. Those were people who had to come onto it voluntarily, whereas somebody who was in Job Seekers Alliance would be mandated onto it at a particular stage, depending on their age. So um, I think the, the feed 
to the program actually fell away over time as the as the uh, uh, unemployment register dropped. Um, and truthfully, I wondered if, uh, if you're looking at trying to flex it, the analogy I would use is we're, 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 we've got a we've got a big cruise ship there. It's like a big tanker, and we're trying to turn around to do different things, and it's taking too slow to turn around. I need I need speedboats here. I need I need to be able to respond to a right bus in Ballymena going down and being able to get in there with the people who need help. At the same time, I need to be able to respond to, 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 to issues in the northwest, maybe where we get maybe some deep deep seated unemployment issues, where we can actually get in and help with people who are long term unemployed. I need to be able to respond to the needs of pe people who are disabled and, and, and wherever they might be. So it's been able to come up with, on a thematic basis, what are the what are the what are the issues that we have? And what are the, what, what are the gaps? So the other thing that we're trying to do with employability and I is to lock in with councils. Yeah. So we've been talking to Solus, we've been talking to Derry and Straban Council, we've been talking to the Belfast City Council, and we are going to be locking in with councils. So we're going to look at a, a council by council area to see what provision do we have in place, what currently works well, and bear in mind our front line works well as part of that. What currently works well in terms of helping people? What gaps do we have? And then the money that we would have been spending on steps to success, how can we better use that money to plug some of those gaps? So that's really what we're trying. That's really what we're trying to do. So far from being a negative, I think this is a positive, and I think it's a it's an, an opportunity of its time, and I, I think it's reflective of a a much more diverse range of people who aren't working, and they need, they need to respond to that as well. No, it's, thanks for, for your clarification. I suppose probably we all welcome the low levels of unemployment, but it, it's it's good that a program tailors to the needs of of the time in which we live. So I welcome your clarification. Now, the other point. Would be, and you mentioned about most of the concerns around universal credit and around the, po the broader policy elements. And I suppose probably one concern that I have, I just wanted to raise with you, is in relation to those in employment, but also entitled to universal credit, and particularly around the process of closing a claim if uh, two payments or salary payments are, are paid or deposited in an account in, a qualifi in the qualifying period yeah. of four weeks. Um, quite often, this actually is having such a negative impact on the most vulnerable because um, these double payments quite normally happen around holiday time, uh, particularly around Christmas actually when this has happened and, and then now universal claims being closed as a result of the double payment. Yeah. I think there's there's issues around there's, that. There are. Uh, and and, and if you could address Well, just to say to you that uh, we're grappling with it currently. Yeah. And we have been grappling with it for a wee while, so uh, I, I would like to be able to, to, to bring that one back. I have a couple of people who are specialising in, in this okay. to try and bottom this out. Uh, not easy, it's, and it's, ha it's happening across the islands as well. So it's just, it's just not it's just not here. No, I appreciate that, and I would like the further information because I suppose probably those people who are, are still trying to yep. do, go to the workplace and, and, and become active oh, yeah. in terms of oh, moving away from wh whether it's universal credit or whatever, but they're, they're being penalised by, by some small public administration yeah. um, so, so, design here in, in this regard. So we could come back on that one, yeah. Chair. We'd, yeah. we'd like to be able to have a de detailed look at that one with you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, Robin? Sir, Chair, this is the second time in this meeting you've gone in ahead of me on well, what okay. I was... Uh, Chair's prerogative. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, Just very quickly, could... Uh, I mean, the... the the, the picture you're painting column of universal credit is is not the uh, what I see in face to face with the uh, constituents. And you use the word sometimes people think it's fearful. I actually do find people thinking it is very fearful uh, where they go. But in terms of the work that's being done, would you just uh, perhaps say a few words on? The three approaches, the DWP work coach led, HMRC led, and the partner led uh, approach. That's to do with the uh, that's to do with the uh, pilot in Harrogate. The pilot, yes. Yeah. Um, what they're trying to do is work on the basis of who knows the who knows the claimant best. So who's best placed to help someone who probably is quite vulnerable. Yes. Uh, who maybe isn't going to be able to cope very well with with going online, doing stuff digitally, filling the forms. Understanding are they actually going to be better off whenever they do move across to UC? So, the view would be let's. The reason why Harrogate's going so slowly is there's a handhold happening here, mm -hmm. and the question is who's best place to hold the hand. So, doing a wee bit of a pilot to test 
is a work coach better doing it? Is it somebody from Revenue and Customs better doing it? Because a lot of people, are, a lot of these customers will be tax credit customers. Yeah. Um, and that's what, what, what they're really testing. And the other one about partner-led is could the advice sector or, some, or someone else be procured to do that? So there's, there's, there's testing of, of some of that. And they have an organization over there who's, do, who's doing some of that. So it's really trying to work out what the people respect, respond to best. Yeah. Uh, who, do they, who do they trust most? Uh, in the sense of being able to actually go with go with it, um, and that's not trying to. There's no tomfoolery in that. That's not trying to blindside anybody. It's just trying to get people's confidence built up. That you know, if you if you if you if you Google universal credit and you lift any newspaper and you and you read stuff, you even saw the, the probably the, the the program on Tuesday in BBC about yes. the reality of universal credit uh, for some people. Uh, typically, I think the challenges you'll see are, ch are challenges for people who have got a level of vulnerability, whatever that may be. Um, and I think that's where, so I'm not downplaying any of that. That's why I'm talking about like, training of our work coaches being really, really crucial. I'm trying to make sure that we're, 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 up, we're up to that and building the specialisms and so on. So I think, I think to move people who have been on the likes of Employment Support Alliance for a very, very long time across into, into universal credit, it's going to take a lot of really positive, careful, sensitive handling, yeah. um, and, and that's what that pilot's all about. And I commend, actually, whilst it's frustrating, it's slow, I commend the approach that's been used by DWP. There's nothing ram dash with this. Um, and actual fact, the idea that they're going to extend a little bit further, because whenever this does start, the numbers start to ramp up. Yes. There's only so much capacity that we could take in terms of transferring across on a month-by-month -month basis. So I, I, that's why I'm saying I do think there needs to be more dialogue on it. So we recognise there are difficulties that people have. We recognise the fear. I'm not trying to, to, to whitewash anything. Uh, I know there are, 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 are difficulties with the policy. Um, but also there are strengths in it too, and there are things that have worked very, very well. And there's a lot for Northern Ireland to be proud of in terms of what it's done, mm -hmm. how it's approached some of this. And, and in terms of, uh, you know, how, how will the client, you know, whether it's a work coach or whether it's HMRC or partner-led, how will that be achieved? What do you try to understand? Uh, when you make a decision, DWP Pilot is exploring the three approaches. Oh, they'll, they'll do an evaluation. They'll do a formal evaluation of this over a period of time, and they'll say, OK, let's, let's see if we can get to something which is scalable now. Right. So you're doing, you're doing small-scale pilots here. So like if you're taking 10,000 people out of what GB have to migrate, you're talking to very, very yes. small numbers. Yes. And in Northern Ireland terms, we, you know, this will impact on 192,000 people yes. in terms of our, our metrics. So you just, you, you just got to sort of take it very, very steady and be very clear that you've got a process that will work. You've got the right partners chosen to do it for you. And you know you can move people from, from, from A to B and from one benefit to the other and do it, and do it successfully. So I think for me, this, this isn't about herding people from one thing to the other and hoping for the best. And, and th that's why I'm pleased with by D D I'm really pleased by the time they're taking over this because they're not, and I think Amber had a lot to do with it as well. I think she's, she was very focused on the time said, this makes sure we get this right. I know she's departed the scene, but the policy's still there. There's still that view that we'll do this the right way. Okay, thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Emma? Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't want to labour the point because I know uh, we could probably all provide anecdotal evidence of different constituents that we've had that have had problems with both wider benefits and with UC in particular. Um, maybe I'm flying the flag for my own rural constituency and I know that like even in Project Stratum, the identified I think was 97,000 people across the north that didn't have access to what you would call adequate broadband. So, and I know from personal experience, that's been an issue that I've had, particularly with new applicants. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, to get on and see and the, the online system, and we've just ended up in most of those situations using a computer in our own office to, to do that. Right. And then the follow up then becomes problematic, and I think it's a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. You go into your dual office, it depends on, on who you're dealing with and the level of expertise and all the rest of it. Just um, following on from that, because you'd mentioned earlier, but an online system for discretionary support fund mm -hmm. that would ring alarm bells for me but how that would work then for people that are in dire straits mm -hmm. as well as that just a wee query about um when people are receiving letters about reviews and this is across esa and pip yeah. the people that and obviously a lot of the time people that are, are 
applying for these benefits or are depending on benefits or in vulnerable positions as it is. And oft times you find that there's a sense of panic that they assume that something has changed in their circumstances right. and they you know it's it's a, it's a it's a source of panic and, and mm. distress for them. So I just I don't know what better way you could, in terms of the the literature that they receive or the correspondence, change the terminology so that it's this is a, a mandatory procedure. This is there's nothing out of the ordinary that has happened mm. because most times their their situation hasn't changed and there's absolutely no change to their benefit. Yeah. And it's it's a whole <coughs> of panic and and you find people. You know, and then they're maybe putting it off, and yeah, you're, well, you're down to you, you're, you're, you've caught pretty well on one of the downsides of having a D, having the GB system, DWP system, because a lot of those letters are, are system generated letters. Yes. So to actually, believe it or not, change the wording of those letters takes a long time, and a lot of money to do it as well. So that that that's part of the issue. But we're alive to that, and we we I mentioned earlier the survey that we talked about, the yes. independent survey. The independent survey wasn't just as glowing in terms of our accessibility of our written communications. Our written communications could be better, and we accept that. Um, so that's something that we want to try and improve. But I wouldn't expect an overnight transition in that, because we don't have total control over it. But it's something that I'm very focused on on, on, on having a look at and to, to see how, to see how we can make it make it better. The other wee issue, by the way, just about the rural. I live in a rural location. Okay. My broadband shocking. So if this committee can do here. anything to impress on 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 the finance committee, I think maybe economy. That, economy, economy yeah. that that we need better broadband uh, will help you see generally. It will help me personally as well. So it'll be really really good. I'm with you on that one. Okay. You want, did you have a supplementary just, on this we, issue? Yes, just a wee tiny one, to um, Mandatory reconsideration. Are there any figures uh, indicating? how many decisions have been changed when an applicant makes the reconsideration application? Which benefit are you thinking of? Pip. 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 Yeah. Um, there's about 10% of the, the, the cases have gone to appeal. Um, that's out of about 200,000. When you look at the total across that in terms of those that have been overturned, about 3% have been overturned. One thing that's important to, um, to bear in mind and that is quite often the reason it's been overturned is because new evidence has been presented at appeal and that's something we're looking at in terms of how to make sure that the evidence has been presented on a, you know, when we're actually doing the consideration of the case and I think it's an area that the, you know, the independent review is going to look at as well. Um, three percent overturned at mandatory reconsideration, but fifty plus overturned at appeal. Am I right in that? Yeah, it's. I'm trying to do the maths in my head, but yeah, at appeal, yeah, but out of the the total. Uh, yeah, it seems there's a huge gap between the mandatory reconsideration and the appeal. We, we can we can probably probably follow up with a sort right. of actually the list of the numbers for you on on that yeah. because yeah. it's it's. It's uh, yes, it's three, it's it's three percent of the ten percent. Yeah, you know, which yeah. is it depends which which figures we're talking oh, well, about. There's yeah. a bit of mouths in it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. I have Kelly, Andy, and then Mark. So Kelly. Yeah, I'm looking at um, you, the work and wellbeing division um, and getting people into work, maybe who have long-term health um, or disability. Um, there's a cliff edge here we're we're creating in society. I have a number of constituents. And believe me, with, with having a disability and being involved in disability for years, there's quite a high number of people with disabilities come to talk to me. Uh, basically, you're 25, you may as well just put the, you know, lock the door and stay in the house because an awful lot of the schemes that have been available to date have been NVQ after NVQ, and they go into employers and they get six months' work and then they're out again. Um, no, nowhere very quickly. No, yeah, exactly. And and the other thing about it is they're put into places where it's almost impossible for them to travel to, because there isn't an accessibility travel option done. Um, and it's one of the pieces that I've been given health an extraordinarily hard time about, that when somebody moves from child services into adult services, and it's like this with, with young people with disabilities, it's as if they don't exist once they become adults. They go into this system where they're trying to find them work, and they get trained to be held. I don't know how many people have done NVQ level, up to level two on the same course every year, over and over again. They get six months' work, out again, another course, another provider. Oh, my goodness, it is driving me nuts in the office. <coughs> it's driving those families to distraction. Mm -hmm. We have a number, or number, we have a massive amount of older carers who are looking at this system and going, this isn't working. Yeah. So is that going to be part of this review? It is we indeed. need to do better. And I think the sector, the disability sector, and us together, and, and, and DFC, 
have, are coming together and we have to take a real hard honest look at this. I think employers need to be involved yeah. in that discussion because it's them that's putting them out after six months. Well, yes. And, and the other the other bit I'm interested in, I know the sector is very negative about disability confidence, which ha, which is a, a standard across the, in, in GB. I'm watching the the employment rate of uh, disability coming up really really well in GB, and and uh, the unemployment rate has been halved. They had a target of halving that, so I'm, I'm very keen to see how that has happened. I'm wondering has disability confidence played a role in it? I know the sector hated here. But what I'm saying to them is that there needs to be a version of that here that works, that doesn't not just allow an employer to sign on. There have to be genuine commitments that an employer has to, has to sign up to. Uh, and I think, OK, there's one issue about the, number of, the amount of regulation employers actually face, but at the same time, we've got to come up with a, a, a new paradigm here that helps people get with disabilities get meaningful jobs and grow in those jobs and be able to get other jobs. Because um, I, I would share the same view as you. I think people have been recycled too many times. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a, there has to be a different, a different take on it. It's easier said than done, but we're, we're wanting to start that process off. And I think the Chair mentioned that the two-year two -year mandate, what will you achieve in the two-year mandate? One thing I'd love to achieve in that two-year mandate is a different outlook, a different outlook on the employment of people with disability. And I think uh, we're happy to come back here. We're happy for the sector to come here with us. Um, talk about that. Yeah, I, I would be quite keen. This is a cross-cutting theme because if infrastructure cuts public transport, that affects the ability, person's ability to get to work. If health does something with adult services, it creates the difficulty. The disability strategy is going to be key on this one because yeah. this is the one that's going to help. But it, it is a one that I am very concerned we, about. We, we should have had you in the innovation lab back in June uh, because that, that was all that stuff that came out. Yeah. To um, but I'm wondering. The figures have to be real figures mm -hmm. because there are too many, many people being considered as not being on or as, as being in employment when actually all they're doing is, is doing the third time they're doing the MQ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's the real figures. How many people are going into those courses and are dropping out age 25 or age 30 and then don't have other alternatives that they can go to? Um, that's my concern. And in rural areas, yeah. the number of disabled. Um, adults in rural areas sitting at home with their parents because there isn't anything else and they don't want to go to a day centre looking at four walls because they can work and yeah. they want, this is a, a cohort that wants to work and they're wonderful when they get to work if they have the appropriate support but I just wonder do our employers because I look at the council structures and there's lots of things about building businesses and sustainability and enterprise and that percentage of people, maybe a small percent, maybe one percent of the local workforce are sitting at home underemployed because there's that lack of, of commitment. You're in the same space as us, and, and that's, that's, that's the challenge we see as well. <coughs> okay, thanks, Kelly. Andy? Yeah, just, just a very quick point, Colin, um, and I know you touched this on, uh, on your presentation, um, and it was an, uh, an issue that divided the Assembly at the time. It was the LCM, the Transfer Welfare Reform Powers to Westminster, and you'd, you'd mentioned that there's discussions in relation to transferring them back to the Department. Is there any detailed timeline as to when that's expected to happen? There's not at this stage, um, and the discussions have happened between Anne and I over a cup of coffee, effectively. So we're we're kind of at that point with it now, where we know that it has to come back. And you know, Anne probably have had conversations in terms of uh, her colleagues and I, NIO potentially as well. So she can talk to you more about that in a second or two when she comes on. But um, that's something I think is important that it does happen, um, and I think that gives the the proper accountability sitting here that it should be here. Yeah, given uh, we're five years on. Hmm? Given we're five years absolutely. on, absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we would see that, that, that sooner rather than later. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly the time scale, but okay. I'll check with them on that one as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Colin, for that presentation. Certainly admire your optimism and positivity, though well, I don't think it would go so far as to describe it as in in infectious. You said yourself, you do recognise the figure yeah. out there around uh, universal uh, credit and that fear is, is well founded, I suppose, in many instances, and it's instances where, where there are horror stories, and there are plenty uh, of them that we don't need to watch documentaries on BBC uh, to see about, but, but news of those spreads and, and spreads quickly. I'm delighted to hear that you are looking at, or, or have tasked people to look at the issue that Johnny raised. You know, there, there, there is work that we can do within the constraints of parity. I think, uh, or I cer certainly hope, uh, to, to reduce the burden of this placement on people. And when you're looking at that sort of double payment 
issue in a, in a, in a period. I, I, I would hope that maybe they can look at issues like the earnings floor as well mm -hmm. uh, for self-employed people because you know, parity doesn't mean parity. You know, and, and there is sort of regular room there to, to do things better and, and to appreciate the efforts that are being made uh, to do so. Uh, my ears did prick up a wee bit. He <coughs> talked about the virtually full employment mm -hmm. that we have, but I know that he came back to the North West, mm -hmm. uh, where, where we're far from. I know that. Uh, that, that uh, and I do welcome, I suppose, the fact that we are going to look at area specific mm -hmm. measures to mm -hmm. tackle area specific uh, problems. Uh, in, in terms of the, the work being done in the high standard of work, as acknowledged by DWP, and <coughs> In their rollout, and you mentioned uh, the five centres, I think, that that's been done from. Uh, full credit to the staff for that, but uh, how much of that staff, or what percentage would be your staff, or departmental staff, or how much of it's agency staff? Um, there's about a thousand of our staff are agency staff. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that to one, to one extent, uh, Mark, because. We've had an issue about the hours that DWP work, so there's an eight-day shift mm -hmm. in there. Now that shift isn't. We don't bring people in and say you are there for 12 hours, so people have flexible patterns within that. Um, but from a, 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 a trade union side perspective, there would be a view that any existing member of staff shouldn't have to work those hours unless they volunteer to do it. Some people have volunteered to, to do that, which means it could be after an evening work, for example. Uh, but by and large, there hasn't been a, a big queue of people wanting to do those hours. So that has kind of pushed us down the road of having to go and get more, more uh, temporary staff in. Um, the other interesting piece, though, of course, is during a lot of this period of time, we haven't been recruiting. Mm -hmm. Civil service hasn't been recruited because of the recruitment freeze and because of the, the, the cost constraints that are around all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the recruitment agency staff have been typically of a younger age profile. Uh, so it's been really interesting when you walk into either large centres and you see the mix of people, uh, or you walk into other areas where we don't have recruitment agency staff and you see older people. Uh, and they, there's going to be a bit of a loss of diversity actually for us as a, a as a delivery arm and as, yeah. a, as a service generally, because we weren't recruiting as actively. Now, thankfully, we've just had a, a, an admin officer campaign underway. I think it's about 15,000 applicants for it, so we're, we're, not, we're an attractive employer. But when we're looking for people who will be able to work flexible work patterns in that as well, so and again, and that will help us deal with bringing down the numbers of, of, of agency staff. And a lot of those agency staff will be applying for those jobs as well, Mark. So they're, they're not precluded in that. Specialised in some yeah, and, and we're looking we're looking for people with good common sense, customer focus, and, and capability to handle the public. So that's the sort of thing we're after. That's and and that's pretty explicit in terms of our of our of our process and our paperwork around that. So the the other comment that we've had from from managers, uh, from DWP visitors, even from the performance statistics. When you see people coming in who have no preconceived ideas of what it's like to work in social security, um, now there's one there's one person I was talking to the other day who gave up uh, working as a, a bank official, went into the ESSA centre, worked in the ESSA centre for three years, and I said, why, why? He said because I wanted to, and I loved it. But but him had been three years done in ESSA. It got samey. I needed to do something different, <coughs> and, then, and, and then she was moving yeah. on to do something different. So, for part of the challenge we have, I talked about people staying for 19, 20 years, is moving them around the place. And I think historically we've left people too long in one place. We haven't freshened up enough, and that's why the operational <coughs> delivery profession is very important to us because it allows us to actually build careers and move people around the place. And I'm hoping, I'm really hoping to see a lot of the the the, the temporaries applying for those jobs, and, and fingers crossed, we'll see a lot of them been very, very successful. The other nice thing is because, and this is back to the systems, the systems are much, they're much more intuitive for people to learn. So if you haven't been a work coach in a previous life, or if you haven't been working on, on, on JSA systems, and you come in to work in those new agile systems, it's like meat and drink to you, and you, you know you have nothing to learn. Yeah. It's brand new. You get into it. So, and we have a lot of graduates coming in to do those jobs, so they, they pick it up really, really fast. So there's that kind of difference as well, but there's a, there's a lovely blend actually that we do have between the, the wealth of experience that we've got, real hands-on practical experience, and new people coming in, new ideas, 
but also learning the older hands about how to do things. Mm -hmm. So we were, we're, we're, we're seeing both of those streaming together very, very interestingly. Okay, thanks, Colm. And then just touching on one other issue, Emma had expressed concerns, I suppose, about the proposed digitalisation mm -hmm. of discretionary s support, and again, that's, I suppose, well founded, not just in terms of, I suppose, the inability of people in certain areas or the difficulty that people have accessing mm -hmm. uh, it, it because it is online. I think particularly in the realms of discretionary support, because sometimes digitalisation removes any discretion or in, in, in any regular room, yeah. room for the application of common sense. All right, well, uh, I think the application, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the staff in, in those areas in discretionary support, and the application of common sense and compassion. Yes. <coughs> uh, I mean, that, that's, you're, you're sort of, that's your, that's your last safety net. Uh, and our staff recognise that. Okay, we have limitations. You know, you're, you're allowed three loans in the year and, and one grant. You know, can't go above the thousand pounds or whatever else. But people are recycling through that an awful lot, and we, we watch how people use that. Um, look, we we're trying to put a system in place that would be Northern Ireland system that that people would find easy to use and would be universally available. So if we and when we get into this, if we we recognise that there are difficulties with this. We'll, have, we'll look at all the options. At the minute, what we're trying to do is totally transition from a, a tele telephony-based system that isn't working as well as it should to one that will allow us to get to a halfway house, and then we can, we can explore from no, there. It would take us about two or three years to get through to get through the digitalisation project, even just to get to the stage of of having options slash through, you know. And when we look at any sort of change to how you know a person would access the systems, we're always very mindful that it's not one size fits all. So while a lot of the people who would use our services would actually welcome moving to online, we always have to have the arrangements in place that if it doesn't suit someone, they need face to face or, or a different um, method of accessing the service, that we have that in place as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Tracy, Jackie, Callum. Um, I think you've given us enough there to fill a forward work programme. Um, <laughs> never mind next, uh, the next three weeks. So thank you very much for thank you. Thank you joining well. us today. Thank you and very much. Just members, I think then on the back of that, um, I think we need to look then at um, the welfare reform mitigations, getting a, a briefing on it, um, penciled in maybe for the 20th of February. And then also we can invite the members of the Cliff Edge Coalition also along to brief the but in that members agreed? Yes, agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think now members, I'm just looking at the time, if we could stop even for a fifteen minute break and come back at ten to ten to one, would members be in agreement just for a comfort break for fifteen minutes? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> declare the meeting open again and we're going to move on to agenda item six which is consideration of statutory rules um, and just remind <coughs> this is just continuing on with our consideration of statutory rules and firstly going to consider two statutory rules relating to child maintenance they are found at agenda item six and seven and i'd like to welcome Anne McCleary, john noble paul mckenna and john and furphy to the table um, then we will look at the two rules. Are you going to take those two rules together then? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Then over to you. Uh, Chair, can I first thank you for giving us the opportunity to come along here and talk to you about yet more regulations. Um, but particularly at the outset, can I just thank you for giving me a quick, I promise it'll only be two minutes, to introduce myself to those of you who don't know me. There will be a number of you who are more than familiar with, with me, um, and we've been through a lot together, and I think we all have scars. Um, but it's good to be back, good that we're all back here together, because uh, we have been working uh, back in the department very hard. I know there may not have been an awful lot going on in these precincts, but we have had to keep business as usual going for the benefit of the population. And, and that's largely why we're here today, because there's been a lot going on and we now need to come and talk to you about everything that was going on um, during the interregnum. Um, you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to go through everything I had planned to go through. I've torn that up and I'm going to keep it very, very succinct. Um, 
Again, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Anne McCleary. I'm the Director of Social Security Policy, Legislation and Decision-Making Services. In a previous life, in other words, before we were last here, it was simply uh, Social Security Policy and Legislation. Since then, my role has changed slightly, so that now I also have responsibility for the mitigations and also in relation to decision-making services. So it's a slightly broader remit, but all relevant and all... Um, legal to some extent. Um, we've been very busy. We don't want people to lose out. Therefore, we have kept things going. And as I've said, you're, you're now seeing the regulations that we were putting through. Just to be clear, what we were doing was where there, were, there was um, legislation which we had the power to continue with and which was not controversial and which was for the benefit of our people here we proceeded on and those are the regulations that you have been dealing with over the last couple of weeks and I think we'll be dealing with later on today and by the sound of it next week as well. Um, so we've been working on that. At the same time we've also been working with DWP in relation to the regulations which fall out of the Welfare Reform Order Northern Ireland 2015 and the Welfare Reform Work Northern Ireland Order 2016. And the reason why uh, those regulations were being progressed through Westminster is because whenever we had the legislative consent motion, um, which the Assembly passed, which uh, handed over responsibility in relation to welfare reform to Westminster, um, and there was a sunset clause with that, which meant there was a year during which <coughs> Westminster had primary power to deal with primary legislation in, uh, for Northern Ireland in that limited range. It also meant that whenever regulations were made falling out of those two sets of, re of those two orders, those regulations <coughs> also had to be progressed by Westminster. So we've been working with DWP on those. Um, those regulations can only s return to us whenever there is an order through the Westminster um, process. That has not yet been done. We are in discussion with uh, DWP about that and we'll see how that goes but there has to be a specific order made by Westminster before that can return back to us. That is I'm assuming what everybody here would like simply so that there is local scrutiny of all of those regulations but that is the process. There will be a letter going to you uh, in, the, in the next couple of days I believe which will explain that again but essentially that's what it is that the um, subordinate legislation, responsibility for the subordinate legislation that falls out of the Welfare Reform Order Northern Ireland 2015 and the Welfare Reform and Work Northern Ireland Order 2016, which is essentially the welfare reform stuff, that uh, still rests with Westminster. But I can assure you that DWP are quite keen to give it back to us. Okay, so we have that going on. Um, we've been doing that. Uh, we are also working on the mit mitigations. We've worked on the extension of the existing mitigation schemes. I've spoken to various members in various capacities over the last few months about that. Uh, we are now in the happy position that we know what way we're going to proceed with that. Um, the um, new decade, just get the handle on this exactly, new decade, new approach makes it clear that we will be extending those existing mitigations and then uh, there w there's a commitment also in that to looking at further mitigations. Now we'll see how that, that goes. Uh, I th the committee has just said that they, they wanted to have a presentation on that soon. Um, it's very early for us to be saying anything terribly definitive on that, but we will be working on that. And I know that Minister is committed to co-design, mm -hmm. so you can expect that we will be coming to you, even if, though you had asked for it, we would have been coming to you in any event in relation to that. And we will be working with the sector and deciding exactly how we're going to progress that. Uh, Minister is also very committed and has spoken at length about the need for compassion in all of this. And I think that all of this is indicative of how we're going to, going to proceed. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say, other than, you know, hello, I'm here. Uh, give me a call if you need any uh, assistance. And I will hand over to my esteemed colleagues who know the detail of the various regulations that uh, you need to look at and to approve. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.
Okay, thanks very much. Good work. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to take you through just some background on the child maintenance compliance and arrear strategy, and then my colleague Paul will take you through the actually two sets of regulations uh, which we're um, giving you evidence on. Um, and we've also got Jonathan Furphy from the Child Maintenance Service with us, just in case there's any um, sort of technical questions on, on the ground. With the introduction of the Child Maintenance Service in December 2012 and the closure of the 1993 and 2003 Child Maintenance Legacy Schemes, work had been ongoing with the aim of improving compliance and reducing the overall balance on the old Child Maintenance Legacy Schemes. In November 2017, the Department was included in a UK-wide consultation by the Department, or sorry, led by the Department for Work and Pensions on the proposed um, array of compliance and arrears strategy. Um, the key objectives of that strategy were to continue to prioritise resources to benefit children of today, continue to encourage parents to collaborate over the child maintenance arrangements where they can, as this is the best interest of their children, uh, continue to minimise <coughs> the arrears accrual in the child maintenance services, uh, further improve compliance through changes to child maintenance calculations, <coughs> strengthen uh, collection powers across all child maintenance schemes, address the historic arrears which are owed to both parents and the department that have built up under the old systems, uh, and avoid the government uh, stroke taxpayer funding uh, high cost attempts to recover historic arrears which would not result in any money going directly to the children. The strategy itself had been developed with input from colleagues um, uh, and from the policy and legislation context and also the operational side, the child maintenance service. It was a consultation uh, take a consultation document on the strategy set out the proposals to address the arrears as well as the proposals to improve compliance through new enforcement powers. Uh, there were several uh, proposed changes to the way that the child maintenance service in Northern Ireland would work, included in the new compliance and arrears strategy. Uh, those changes can be broken down into two key areas. Uh, changes that aim to improve the compliance to reduce the amount of the arrears uh, accruing on, um, on the system, and changes that aim to reduce the arrears balance on the old legacy to, uh, 1993 and 2003 systems. Uh, just in context of the actual arrears itself, there was about 9,500 arrears cases actually on uh, the two systems. Um, it, uh, we've currently um, actioned about 21.3 million um, of that um, uh, arrears. Um, and another further uh, up to £10 million is due to be completed over the next couple of months. Uh, arrears would relate uh, mainly to cases where the children are now um, adults, uh, given that the schemes were 1993 and 2003. Attempting to collect um, would accrue significant cost. Um, a high number of the cases were deemed <coughs> uncollectible. Uh, a trial in 2016 by DWP showed that about 32% of parents to whom the debt had been owed wanted it to be written off. Cases were made up of very small amounts of under £65, and other cases were very small amounts of actually less than £10. Uh, we haven't seen, received very many payments um, or any payments on the system since January 2012, and over 60% of the cases in a proportion of these cases have never actually made a payment. It is likely that much of the arrears was not real due to the penalty assessments at the time and inaccurate or out-of-date calculations of the old systems. Uh, and, in, and in brief, the, the arrears are, are obviously old, generally uncollectible, and most pa uh, parents uh, would accept this. In many of the cases linked to the arrears, the child maintenance service have no current information about the non-resident parent, and the more time passes, the harder it has become uh, to trace them. It was therefore believed that there was now an opportunity to draw a line under the old systems and consider a different approach to the accumulated arrears. Uh, this was due to the following reasons. Ma uh, maintaining the arrears on the old legacy system will incur significant technology uh, costs going forward. This cost would continue long term into several decades and CMS here would be expected to contribute to the cost as we use the GBIT system. Um, it is estimated the costs are actually about £15 million pounds per annum. Attempting collection would be complex, expensive, and as expected would only yield minimal arrears uh, recovery. This option would require extensive resources with no guarantee of success. Particular uh, consideration needed to be given to the issue of the out-of-date contact details for all parties. Uh, it has been estimated that the average cost of taking a case through the enforcement process is about £1,000 and potentially wouldn't yield any, any, uh, any success. Uh, writing off the arrears was a low-cost approach which could generate significant savings and would enable the current child maintenance service to focus resources on making the overall service as effective as possible uh, in maximising compliance. 
Uh, on the actual uh, UK-wide consultation on the strategy, uh, it was consulted upon between December 2017 and the, uh, sorry, February 2018. Uh, there was a, a UK-wide response of 99 responses to the consultation, 11 from organisations and 88 from private individuals, of which 21 identified themselves as paying parents and 24 as receiving parents. Two of the responses were from Northern Ireland uh, organisations. Uh, we accepted some of the changes um, suggested, actually, uh, that our stakeholders had made through the consultation. The majority of the suggestions related to more to the operational processes and procedures and client communications, so we're not directly related to the content of the actual regu regulations. Most of these suggestions were around areas that we had already planned to work on, uh, such as making the best use of the current powers and using trace tools to ensure we write to clients at the correct address. Uh, when the Consultation concluded. The department then had actually considered the responses. Uh, there was a, a, a document published uh, outlining the, the res, um, department's response, or sorry, the, uh, the UK's response to the consultation. Uh, and then we obviously worked uh, alongside <coughs> DWP to bring forward the, the relevant um, confirmatory rules. The rules, the strategy rules, were required to bring about the proposed changes that aim to improve the compliance and also to re deal with the reduction in the amount of the arrears. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Paul, who's going to take you through the two sets of regulations that actually were uh, implemented. Yeah. Hello again. Okay, I'm going to take you through uh, package one first, which is agenda item number six. Um, the first packet of regulations I'm going to discuss is SR 2019 number 221, the Child Support Miscellaneous Amendments number three, regulations <coughs> from Ireland 2019. Now, as John alluded to, these regulations are subject to confirmatory procedure. And they are a remade version of SR 2019 number 116 and SR 2018 number 210, which have been revoked. These regulations provide for powers which were introduced back in December 18 to continue in force. Now, the main purpose of these regulations was to improve how child maintenance liabilities are calculated, increase the range of collection and enforcement powers, help collect more money for children, and to address the historic arrears that have built up under the legacy schemes. Um, changes also help prevent non-resident parents with complex financial arrangements from artificially lowering their kind of their child maintenance liability, as well as closing, oh, closing, sorry, excuse me, closing loopholes that previously existed by introducing new provision for orders enabling regular or lump sum deduction orders made from joint accounts, sole trader accounts, and unlimited partnership accounts. And then on top of that, we introduced the powers. Well, extended the powers to allow arrears which had accrued under the schemes to be written off in certain circumstances. These powers, as John alluded to, gave the department the opportunity to give certainty to parents over the approach to the debt, while again focusing on money that would benefit children today. So I'm just going to touch on the brief amount of powers that were introduced. So the first thing was done was in relation to the actual child maintenance calculation. There were amendments made there. So we introduced a power that did exist on the previous legacy schemes to determine a notional income from assets held by a non-resident parent. Again, this just helps child maintenance service um, calculations result in an NRP, sorry, non-resident parent, paying an amount that more accurately reflects their means. And again, we have introduced protections to ensure that the use of the power is proportionate. Um, in relation to deductions that I alluded to, from joint and unlimited partnership accounts. So we extended out the existing powers, now apply regular and lump sum deduction orders to joint accounts and unlimited partnership bank accounts. And we can use lump sum deduction orders on sole trader accounts. And again, there are safeguards in place to make sure there is a proportionate use of the power. And in relation to historic debt that had accrued under the legacy schemes, we extended the write off powers so that enabled the, the Department of CMS to deal with that debt that had built up under those previous schemes. And the regulations actually set out the circumstances in which the Department can exercise that power. So the parent with care would need to make a representation to Child Maintenance Service if they would like a last attempt to collect the debt when Child Maintenance Service are written out. These were in circumstances where the case started on or before November 2008 and the debt is more than £1,000 or the case started after the 1st of November 2008 and the debt is more than £500 
or the arrears accrued under a legacy scheme which has transferred over to the CMS 2012 system and a debt is more than £500. Now, where no representations are received or collection of the debt is not possible, the Department can exercise the power to write off that debt. Um, now, that's where we, we would seek representations, and that's based on those values. Now, the regulations also enable legacy debt to be written off without representation from parents, where, the, where it's a non-paying debt, you know, and for that we would class that as an, at least there hasn't been a payment in the last three months. And again, we move back to the case started on or before <coughs> 1st November 2008, but the debt is less than a £1,000, or the case started after the 1st of November 2008, and the debt is less than £500, or the arrears accrued under a legacy scheme case, which has transferred onto the 2012 system, and the debt is less than £500. So basically, those amounts were, as John talked about, um, subject to a full UK-wide public consultation, and the amounts were selected because it's not, unfortunately, it's just not cost-effective to attempt, attempt collection on individual debts that are less than 500, or debts that are less than a thousand pound, which started on or before 2008. Yeah. So that's all I was going to say on package one. Um, do you, do we want to do questions now or move on to package two? Move on, on then. Okay. Seven. So moving on to agenda item number seven, um, typically we always say package two for this. Um, these again are linked to the compliance and arrears strategy and I will be talking about uh, statutory rule 2019 number 222 and these are named the child support miscellaneous amendments number four regulations Northern Ireland 2019. Again, this is a confirmatory set of regulations that will require a debate, and they are a remade version of SR 2019 number 125, which have been reversed. And as the previous said, these regulations provide for powers which were introduced in 19 to continue in force. Um, overall, these regulations introduced changes that allowed for the continued implementation of the compliance and arrears strategy by really just introducing the, the remaining compliance powers that we consulted on. So, <coughs> the regulations, firstly, they broadened the range of benefits from which arrears of child maintenance can be taken. They expanded the list of persons that CMS can write to and request information be provided. Um, extended write-off powers to extinguish debt where a protected trust deed has been granted to a parent and has expired. I'll come on to that in a moment and then made some further minor and technical changes to the child maintenance calculation and fees regulations. So in relation to the deductions from benefits, we increased the amount that child maintenance service can deduct from benefits towards the arrears. We lifted that to £8.40. Previously that was just £1.40 could have been lifted for arrears only. So basically that aligns with the amount that can be deducted from benefits for ongoing maintenance. Um, we extended deductions for arrears to all of the benefits from which child maintenance can deduct ongoing maintenance. Um, we also made sure that now you will satisfy the ongoing maintenance liability debt and then move on to taking deduction for arrears. So at no point are you going to do uh, ongoing liability and arrears. Satisfy the, the, your maintenance liability and then after that child maintenance service will take the arrears. Um, Okay, we also enabled deductions for ongoing maintenance and arrears from UC, where the non-resident parent has earnings and also meets the criteria for flat rate. Previously, um, the child maintenance service could deduct from UC, but not where there was in earnings. So this is just making sure that all clients <coughs> similar financial circumstances are treated equally. <coughs> now, I mentioned protected trustees a moment ago. Mm. Protected trustee. It's a formal agreement in Scotland between a debtor and their creditors. Um, basically, it's linked into their sequestration, which is like our bankruptcy. So what these regulations did is basically extend our write-off powers so that the Child Service can write off debt when it becomes legally uncollectible as a result of that process, just so they can get it off the system because it can't be collected. Um, information regulations. Now, currently, well, sorry, not current, but previously, mortgage lenders and occupational pension providers had to provide information 
um, that CMS requested, but only upon an inspector calling up the door and asking for it. Basically, we have just amended the regulations so that Chairman and Service can now write them, just streamlining the process, you know, more efficient. And there was another couple of further technical amendments. Um, we changed the way that uh, child maintenance liabilities are calculated for apparent claimant expenses, and that was just following a judgment from an upper tier tribunal. And then we also changed the wording of the fees regulations, just to clarify the policy intent that had always been there, that any debt that accrued on the collect and pay service, or direct pay, and then moved across, uh, including collection fees, would include collection fees, and that those fees are then enforceable. It was just those type of events were just to clarify things. And that is all I want to say okay. on those two packages of regulation. Thank you. I've just, I've just a comment, uh, really, on, on maybe a question as well, um, on, on certainly on the first one. Um, I, I, I am glad to see that this is coming in. We've discussed it. I remember many times this issue going when the way back. Um, uh, that you know, I understand, and I know, as a single parent, you know, ar arrears on child maintenance can cause a really breakdown of relationships yeah. with resident and non-resident parents, which then has a knock-on effect on those children. So it is good that, um, that, like, considering some of them are really from a very long time ago, um, that and that that uh, that's this is going to happen. Um, just on the the, you did, uh, you may have said this, and I've missed it somewhere along the road there. All of those people are going to be written to the, those those. Um, Depending on the level of the debt. Yes, yes, as long as it falls in yes, to the criteria. Yeah. yeah, and it's just on the addresses you have for them, and that's yes. what you're relying on. Okay, no, that's just I just wanted to double check on that. No, that's fine. Andy, did you want to? Yeah, just one very quick one, Paul. Um, you'd said about the arrears being increased from one pound twenty to eight pounds forty. What was the calculation or the method used to calculate that on a weekly basis? Uh, page two. Um, it was basically before you would have, as we said, you would have been taking the ongoing maintenance and the arrears, so basically added to the same amount. Okay. So people are used to that amount coming out of there and collect and pay. So that's the maximum we were taking out of their benefit. So basically, what we've said is, uh, the most important thing is to pay off your ongoing liability. So all that amount should go straight to that, and then once that has been satisfied, there are still arrears. So. You should be paying them, so you are now used to paying that amount. So rather than that one pound twenty, why not eight pound forty? Because in theory, you don't have the ongoing maintenance liability anyway. You're just paying off the arrears which are owed. So it was continuity, and people are used to it. And in the consultation, nobody really—I think it's fair to say that most people were broadly supportive of that. Okay. You could see the benefit of it. Okay. Okay. okay thank you, members. Any questions, comments? No. Okay, then we'll. Sorry, Mark. I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we'll, we'll move on then. So, SR 2019, number 221, the Child Support Miscellaneous Amendments, number 3, Regulation Northern Ireland 2019. Can I ask members if they any objections to this rule? Nope, there's no objections, so I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019, number 221. The Child Support Miscellaneous, Miscellaneous Amendments Number no. Three Regulations Northern Ireland 2019 and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Move on then to SR 2019 Number no. 222, the Child Support Miscellaneous Amendments Number no. Four Regulation Northern Ireland 2019. Any objections to this rule, members? No. Okay, there's been no objections. I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2019 number 222, the Child Support Miscellaneous Amendments number 4, Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in today. And uh, no doubt I will be seeing you frequently as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on and invite Una McConnell and Rosemary Hughes to the table. Are you going to stay on or are you going yeah, to stay? I'm ready. We just reorganise ourselves here. <laughs> All right, thank you.
Okay, members, we're going to now move on to item agenda eight, which is the bereavement support payment number two regulations, Northern Ireland 2019, SR 2019 or SR 2019 number 181 um, and just also uh, just advise members of the clerk's memo on page 124 of your packs on this. So over to you. Okay, um, the Bremen Support Payment number 2 regulations Northern Ireland 2019 SR 2019 number 181. This is subject to <laughs> confirmatory resolution procedure. Uh, the Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 made provision for a new social security benefit bereavement support payment payable to surviving spouses and civil partners. On the 26th of January 2017, the then DFC Minister agreed to the making and laying of the bereavement support payment regulations Northern Ireland 2017. These came into effect from the 6th of April 2017. The bereavement support payments number two regulations Northern Ireland 2019 set out the detail of the new scheme and in particular specify the amount to be paid and the duration of the payments. The new bereavement support payment simplifies financial provision and extends eligibility to those under the age of 45 with no dependent children, replacing the previous suite of bereavement benefits for new claims with effect from the 6th of April 2017. Those already in receipt of bereavement benefits continue to receive their current benefit over the lifetime of their award. Bereavement support payment provides a short-term source of support to help with the immediate costs caused by the death of a spouse or civil partner. It will be paid for a maximum of 19 months, with one initial larger payment plus 18 smaller monthly payments from the date of death. Surviving partners with, one depend or with a dependent child will receive an initial payment of £3,500, with up to 18 monthly payments of £350, and surviving spouses with no dependent children get an additional payment, initial payment of £2,500, with up to 18 monthly payments of £100. A claimant can get bereavement support payments at the same time as other benefits and will not reduce these ben benefits. The original regulations were subject to the confirmatory procedure, which meant that they ceased to have effect if not approved by a resolution of the Assembly within six months of their operational date of the 6th of April 2017. As this has not been possible, the bereavement support payment regulations have been revoked and remade with Secretary's approval twice every each year since the Assembly fell in 2017. This is ensured statutory cover the pay bereavement support payments. The current regulations and the operational date of the 29th of September 2019 will cease to have effect on the 29th of March 2020, ceasing bereavement support payments unless approved by a resolution of the Assembly. And any questions? <coughs> yeah, I think we maybe have a few issues on this one. So we do. Uh, yeah, um, probably out of all the statutory rules, this is the one that sits least easy. Um, well, certainly with myself, um, when we consider the Supreme Court ruling um, yes. on the McLaughlin case, um, and I, I find it very difficult um, to get my head around why that decision was made, albeit I know it was a Westminster decision, and I know that if we, we need to go and we need to pass this because payments will stop if we don't pass it, um, but I think it's just, a, I, I know, and maybe builders will be the same, just want to highlight that it is. It, it, I, I don't think it's good. But I don't think it's good for anybody um, that, that we have to do this. I just I suppose want to ask. Um, you know, has there been any talk with Department of Work and Pensions around this from from ourselves over here um, as to just so when we look, I mean, we talk about human rights and we talk about equality. And you know, to me, this is not meeting human rights or equality. Um, do you, sorry, do you mean discussion with DW yeah. in relation to the regs themselves, yeah. or in relation to McLaughlin? Well, on both. On both. Well, I mean, there, there has just been the normal yeah. conversation in relation to the legislation because, obviously, the legislation was introduced prior to the Supreme Court ruling in, in the McLaughlin case. Um, there has been considerable discussion with DWP in relation to McLaughlin, I can assure the committee of that. I'd imagine yeah. so. Yeah. And I, I don't know, and it's maybe then thinking outside and going away beyond here, but have we looked at all about um, how much it would cost if we were to deviate from the Westminster rule? Um, we, we, if we were to go our own way, um, we, don't have, mm -hmm. we don't have a figure because we haven't really reached that point yet, if, if you understand. Um, but that will certainly be looked into, yes, so yes was, as you would imagine. Okay. It's also fair to say that there is another uh, court challenge to this 
as well. Okay. Along the same, Along the same lines, Anne? Well, uh, it's in re specifically <coughs> in relation to bereavement support as opposed to the Widowed Parents Allowance, which was the McLaughlin case. And if you have read the McLaughlin decision, as we clearly have, uh, one of the things that uh, was said in the McLaughlin decision was that they were reserving their position in relation to a Widowed Parents Allowance, that it was a separate issue, a very okay. different benefit, and that the McLaughlin decision did not read across to this other benefit, because they're done on different, it's done on a very different basis. And also when we look at, at the, the differences in this as well, um, where a, a child or a parent would have received this up to a child was 18 and now we're looking at 18 months instead. Um, again, have we looked at how that, the effect of that? Well, I think the original policy intent was to focus the support at the time whenever the family needed yeah. the most support, which is immediately after the, uh, the death. Um, that was the original policy intent, as we understand it. Um, we are constantly talking to DWP about these things, and uh, I can assure you, as Rosemary has said, it, it's featured fairly heavily. Um, but we are where we are with this, and uh, we'll have to see what happens with, I think there are a number of judicial reviews in connection with these particular and, and I do understand, I fully understand we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. We, have to, we have to agree this in order for people to continue yeah. um, getting their payments. So I do understand that, was the members, Emma? I just echo and thanks, Chair, what you were saying. Um, I mean, I would have another concern about the fact that, obviously, up until very recently, you know, same-sex couples were entitled mm -hmm. to civil partnerships, but not been entitled to... I mean, they're, they're still not entitled to, to get married, but obviously that's changing very shortly. Um, couples that would have been holding out, you know, waiting for that. Mm -hmm. But just wondering what then the intention is then in the meantime, because obviously there's a, a lack of compliance here with human rights. Is there, is there like a stopgap? As in for civil, it is, you are eligible to it if you are or civil, married or a civil partnership. Yeah, yeah, partnerships just, covered. Yes. I am just noting that as an additional concern for, for couples mm -hmm. within that demographic, but I'm saying for, for all couples who aren't married or in a civil partnership at the minute, obviously the court is yes. showed. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, there was a deck, deck yeah, the legislation stands yes. and, yeah. and um, they can only work under the rules contained within the legislation. Yes. Yeah. So yep. there's no the plan yeah. to extend it to cohabiting couples at the minute? Or whatever make up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, do anybody, any other members want to make comments or? Anything on this, Mark? Uh, oh, thank you, Chair, and thank you. Uh, ladies, it's not on the, the McLaughlin issues. They've been well enough covered. It's just in terms of what this is here. The national insurance contributions are relatively easy to satisfy. I wonder if you could explain on that. And it's just I'm drawing on something that came across in a, in a constituency case where carers allowance, you know, in, other contribution-based benefits, carers' allowance is always accepted, or the contributions are taken f from it, but not in uh, the support payment. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm not following. Uh, okay, uh, where someone is in receipt of carers' allowance, uh -huh. okay, and then they cease to be in receipt of, of carers' allowance, or they, they they go on to another benefit. Uh, because they've been on carers' allowance specifically, they're deemed they've been paying contributions. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that applies to uh, most, if not all, the uh, other benefits, but not, but not bereavement support. So there you get somewhere who's partner and carer. The, by definition, I suppose the fact that they have a carer demonstrates that they're vulnerable, but they die, and. The, 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 the survivor doesn't qualify uh, for bereavement No, because support. bereavement um, benefits are based on contributions actually paid. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's different from other benefits in that yeah. regard? In, in that regard, yes. But the deceased must have paid Class 1 or Class 2 mm. contributions equal to... I think they have to pay for at least one tax year during the working life. So if you're yes. caring for someone who's deceased, it's the deceased person who should have paid the contributions. Um, 
Yeah, but so the, your, the deceased your person that's the, the carer. The deceased person was the person who was being cared for. Oh, right, okay. No, the deceased person, the deceased was, person the was the carer. Oh, right, okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll leave the spouse then without, yeah, without, without, without a carer. Yeah, it is on life course. Without a carer. But they worked for one year, I think, in their life. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's now one, yes. one year throughout their entire working life. So hopefully, <coughs> in some cases, would, be numbers would be very small. Yeah. Although they would be very small, as well. Oh. I think the cost oh, yeah. to <laughs> plug okay. that gap would be mm -hmm. very low. But I don't know if that's something that could possibly be looked at in the future, or how we would even go about that. Right. OK, anything else, members? No? OK. Um, um, I just for said, I probably just want, I want to say and I think probably do speak about the committee, that is regrettable that we have to approve something that I feel yeah. is discriminatory. Um, though I do know that we, we really don't have much choice in the matter with this, but I suppose just want to, to put that on the record. Um, then we'll move on then. So can I ask members, um, are they content for us to move this rule? Yeah, okay. And I'll read following into the record that the Committee for Communities has considered the Bereavement Support Payment Number no. 2 Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, SR 2019, Number 181, and recommends uh, that it be approved by the Assembly. Okay. All right. That's where we are. Yes, is that us then? Yeah. Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very short today on our session. <laughs> And then just go on to say to members, um, hopefully next week we'll finish us with this tranche of statutory rules with HMOs. We just to look at next week. Thank okay, you. Um, so just to let you know that. Um, then we'll move on now if members are agreement. Can we move on to any other? Sorry, sorry, just, just on that one, eight one last one. Yes. It was reference made to a number of other challenges that were being yeah. made. Yeah. Could we perhaps, Chair, get some indication yep. of the nature of those challenges and where they're sitting? Absolutely. And I, I know whenever we bring this in front of the Assembly, because um, it has to be brought forward, um, certainly um, if there are other views or other options, we all get a chance to speak anyway. But as Chair, I have written forward um, the view, uh, views that were expressed here today as well. Okay. All right, members, we'll move on then to item number seven, which is any other business. Does anybody have any other elephant business? No? Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item number eight, which is date, time, location of next meeting. Next meeting will be at 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 13th of February, 2020. We'll, we'll have moved rooms. We're going next door into room 30, um, just because the Agriculture Committee have a, an all-day meeting and they need to use this room. So next week, room 30. Okay, members, thank you very much. Assembly, Committee Room 29.